Good morning and uh, everybody. Our first speaker uh, today is Sean Eberhard of the University of Cambridge, who will be talking about probabilistically nilpotent groups of class two. Okay. You got it, Sean. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you to the organizers for putting together such a such a good conference. It must have been very challenging amid um, all the COVID restrictions from around the world. Um, okay, so this talk is going to be about probabilistically nilpotent groups of class two. So I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But um, if you saw uh, Michael Larson's talk from yesterday, he talked about the the, the relationship between identities and approximate identities. And the, um, the real motivation is to study this, this group or this question in groups. And um, Michael studied it in, um, in algebras as a way of making the question a little bit easier. So I'm, I'm going to approach the same question, but in another direction where we, where we think about only the, the simplest possible words just to see what, what sort of positive results um, we can hope to prove. Uh, okay, so um, everything I say is going to be joint work with Pavel Shumyatsky, who's from the University of Brasilia. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we all know what it means for a group to be abelian. A group is abelian if um, whenever you take two elements of, of G, um, they commute, so their commutator is, is trivial. So uh, that's not very interesting. We know what abelian groups are, are like, uh, at least finite abelian groups. Um, it becomes much, much more interesting if you ask, um, how can a group be close to abelian sometimes? What are, what are nearly abelian groups like? So we can um, quantify this in the most naive possible way by just saying, how often is, how, how often is the commutator trivial? So um, if I just take, elements x and y from my group and, um, and plug them into the, so uniformly random elements x and y from the group. And I ask, what's the probability that the commutator of x and y is trivial? So um, in this talk, I'm gonna call that D1. The, the one will become, the meaning of the one will become clear in a moment. And so yes, this is the most naive possible way of measuring how close a group is to being abelian. Um, the, um, the commutator word is, is very nice in that um, for a fixed x, the set of all y which, which satisfies this is, is a subgroup. So um, this, it's easy to see that this, this expression is actually equal to something um, even better studied, which is just the number of consciously classes of g divided by the size of g. Um, so what we'd like to say is that a group is close to abelian if the proportion of elements which commute is, is close to one. Um, there's an immediate problem with that, which is that um, it's impossible for this to get close to one without actually being one. So this is sometimes called the 5 eighths theorem, which says that if this D1 is less than one, then it turns out it must be at most 5 eighths. Um, so that's, um, that's an easy exercise if you know a little group theory. Um, well, what's, what's, more, what's much more interesting is if you ask, um, what can we say if this D1 is bounded away from zero? So if it's at least some constants, what can we say about the structure of the group? And um, as an example of something you might hope to say, for instance, um, if it were true that um, the group G had a bounded index subgroup, which were abelian, that would somehow explain why D1 is, is so large. It would say that um, a lot of the elements commute because a lot of the elements are contained in a, um, a subgroup in which all elements commute. So that's, that's the sort of thing that um, you might hope to prove. But uh, let me just show you a, a basic example which, which, shows, which shows that that's too much to hope for. So I'm gonna show you an example of a group <laughs> that has um, D1 bounded away from, from zero. So a positive proportion of all, all the elements commute, but there is no bounded index subgroup, which is a B. 
So th this is going to be a, um, a nilpotent group that I'm constructing. And, and a good way of constructing nilpotent groups is to start by constructing an algebra. Um, and this is, this is not a very interesting algebra, but um, this way of describing it um, makes sense um, in terms of a, a later, slightly more complicated construction I'm going to show you. So um, this is going to be an algebra over FP, the finite field of P elements. And um, P, P here should be small. So P is like two or three or five, something like that. And I take um, a vector space FP to the N and N is going to become very large. Um, and then my, my algebra just has, it's a graded algebra and it's just got three parts, R0, R1, and R2. And R0 and R2 are just the, just copies of the, of the, um, of the field. So to specify what this algebra is, I just need to tell you what the multiplication map is, which, which is a bilinear map R1 cross R1 to R2. And um, I, can, I can make that whatever I want, and um, that gives me an algebra. So once I've done that, I'm going to let my group G be the, the, um, the group of all elements in this algebra with a unit constant term. So that's a nilpotent group of class two. And if I work out what the commutator is in this group, uh, it's a simple, simple calculation that shows that the commutator of one plus X and one plus Y is one plus F of X, Y minus F of Y, X. So, um, so this group has the property that it's D one is precisely equal to the probability that this, um, this alternating bilinear form is zero. And remember that um, P is, P is small, like two or three or five, and N is quite large. So no matter how large I take N to be, this probability is going to be about one over P. So this is, this is indeed a group in which, um, in which D1 is bounded away from zero, um, but it has no bounded index abelian subgroup. And the reason is if I pass to any um, bounded index subgroup of G, um, that's similar to looking at a bounded index subspace of R1. And um, no, matter, no matter how I, no matter what bounded index, it, it's impossible to pass to a bounded index subspace in such a way as to kill off this, this bilinear form as long as I've chosen F to be sufficiently non-degenerate. Um, for instance, I could take, as long as P is not two, say P is three, and I take F to be an alternating, a, a, a non-degenerate, alternating by linear map, then this will be, again, non-degenerate, um, and it'll work. OK, so, um, so this is a group that does not have a bounded index abelian subgroup. But you can, you can see that this group is still close to abelian in the sense that um, if you look at its commutator subgroup, that's essentially just 1 plus R2 which has size P. So it's, it's possible to quotient out by a very small subgroup so that you get an abelian group. And um, that turns out to be the structure in general. So this is a, a theorem that was proved by Peter Neumann um, in 1989. And the theorem states that if you have a group um, with D1 bounded away from zero, then there's a, a subgroup of bounded index such that its commutator subgroup has bounded size. So, so the general structure of the group looks like this. It's got a bounded part on top and a bounded part on bottom. And in between, you've got this abelian section. And this is really a structure theorem in the sense that um, if you have a group which does have this structure, then it's easy to see that, that this D1 is bounded away from zero. Okay, so, th so this is really a, a prototype for the, for the theorem that I want to actually talk about. So let me just briefly describe um, the, the proof of, of Neumann's theorem. Um, it begins with uh, essentially a version of Markov's inequality, um, which says that if 10% if, if of the pairs X and Y commute, then it must be, it must be true that at least 5% of X commute with at least 5% of Y. It's, that's a basic, that's a, that's a version of Markov's inequality. Um, and that's a useful way of phrasing things because um, for a fixed X, if you just say, what's the probability that Y commutes as X, that's just one over the number of conjugates of X. 
Um, so let's suggest we look at this subgroup, which is generated by all the elements which have at most n conjugates. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting to think of this, the number of conjugates function as a sort of metric on the group. You say you consider an element to be close to the identity if it doesn't have too many conjugates. So this, this subgroup Hn is then the, um, the subgroup generated by the ball of radius n. Um, anyways, if you combine the, the first two points, which, what it tells you is that the subgroup H 2 over epsilon has index at most 2 over epsilon. So what we've managed to do is we managed to pass to a bounded index subgroup in which all elements have boundedly many conjugates. And then what you can do is you can use Dad's theorem. So um, this is a theorem um, due to Bernhard Neumann, who is Peter Neumann's father. Um, it's sometimes called a BFC theorem. So a group is called FC if all the elements have finitely many conjugates. And it's called BFC if, um, if, all of the, if, if the elements have boundedly many conjugates. So if there's some n such that um, every element in the group has at most n conjugates, then what the, the BFC theorem says is that the, the, the commutator subgroup is finite and bounded, and its size is bounded in terms of n. So this is so we can apply this theorem at this point, and it tells you well we apply this to the group to the subgroup H, and we find that the the commutator subgroup of H has size which is bounded uh, in terms of epsilon, which is precisely what we wanted to know. Um, so let me just point out uh, something which is kind of interesting here, which is that um, the group G that we started with needs to, needs to be finite because we're talking about proportions of things and things like that. So it needs to be finite or at least compact or something. But this in this BFC theorem, there's really no need for G to be um, finite. Everything makes perfect sense for an infinite as well as a finite group. Um, so this, this, this BFC theorem is really like the, it's the infinite group cousin or maybe father of, the, um, of Peter Norman's theorem. Um, okay, so, uh, what I would like to investigate is, um, can we prove some analogous result for, for more complicated words? And um, in my view, the, the next um, simplest word is this triple commutator word. So that's what I'm going to be talking about um, from now on, essentially. Um, so a group is class 2 nilpotent if this triple commutator is identically trivial. So what we, we can do... Um, Completely analogously to, to this, to what we did before, we can say that a group is um, close to being class two nilpotent if this word has, um, if you know, you take x, y, and z at random from the group, and you say what's the probability that this triple commutator is trivial? That's what I'm going to call d two. This is the the class two nilpotency degree of the group G. Um, and um, so we would like to, you could study, we want to say two things. So again, like uh, we want to say a group is very close to class two nilpotent if it's, if this is close to one. Um, but there is again, a sort of um, version of this five eighths theorem, or it turns out to be a three sixteenths theorem in this case. It's not too difficult to prove that um, D2 can't get close to one without being exactly one. So again, the, the more interesting question is studying what happens um, Near, near the lower end of the spectrum. So what can we say if this D2 is, is bounded away from zero? Um, so uh, one answer to this question was given by Shalev. Um, and what Shalev's result says that is that if, if, G is, um, if G is a finite group and if D2 is bounded away from zero, and if moreover G is generated by R elements, then there is a subgroup whose index is bounded in terms of epsilon and R, and which is class two nilpotent. So G has a structure, it's got a bounded bit on top and it's got this class two bit on bottom. So this, this structure is simpler than what appeared in um, uh, Neumann's theorem, that we don't have this bounded part on top and a bounded part on bottom. And the reason is this um, boundedly many generators assumption. So this, this really 
changes the character of the problem, in my opinion. And if you look at the um, example we constructed before, um, we really needed uh, unboundedly many generators for this for this example um, to work. Um, so, right. So what we were looking at is we were trying to drop this assumption that there are boundedly many generators. And um, so this is what we came up with. Um, so we have a finite group G and D2 is bounded away from zero. Then the conclusion is that there is a subgroup whose index is bounded and such that the size of gamma four is bounded. So G has this structure. There's a bounded part on top and a bounded part on bottom. And in between you have a, you have a section which is class three. So, um, so this is not what you would naively hope for. You would naively hope to prove the same thing, but with class two here. Um, in the sense that that's what, that's what would give you a, a reverse implication. So if you had a group which was bounded by class two by bounded, then it's easy to see that D2 is bounded away from zero. Um, but this is all we were able to prove. And um, I want to, I also want to show you an example that shows that in general, G will not be bounded by class two by bounded. So the, the naive structure that you would hope for is not actually true in general. Um, okay, so the plan for the rest of the talk is to describe this example for you and then, um, and then to outline some of the details that go into the, into the proof of this theorem. So um, if there are any questions about what I've said before, now is a good time to get them in. Well, I should have said, if there, if there are any questions, it's okay to just interrupt me. <clears throat> um, okay, so, right, so I'm going to describe an example where G has D2 bounded away from zero, but is not bounded by class three by bounded. And in fact, I'll show something a little stronger. So, or G is not bounded by class two by bounded, I should say. Now, if G were bounded by class two by bounded, um, then the, you could take the centralizer of the, of the bottom bit and the middle bit. And that would show that G is in particular um, class three by bounded, as in virtually class three. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you an example of a group which is not even that. So you, so you really do need this bottom, um, this, you really need to quotient about something in the bottom. That's what this group, what the example is gonna show you. Okay, so again, we're going to construct a nilpotent group. And a good way of doing that is to construct an algebra. So again, we're going to construct an FP algebra where P is some small prime, any small prime, say five. Um, and um, I'm going to take a vector space FP to the N where N is, N is large. So the, the, the algebra is again, a, a graded algebra. It's got five graded parts. Um, R0 and R4 are um, just copies of FP. R1 and R3 are just copies of my vector space. And R2 is the tensor square of my vector space. And to, um, to fully specify this, this algebra, I need to tell you what all the multiplication maps are. And I need to um, check that everything is associative. Um, so I won't, I won't tell you all the details, but for instance, this the multiplication map from R1 to R2, so R1 cross R1 to R2, that's just the universal map. Um, so I, I won't tell you all the details of what all the multiplication maps are, but um, the, the part that matters is the following. So you take your favorite, um, your favorite symmetric bilinear map and your favorite alternating bilinear map, and I'm going to call those dot and wedge, um, and then um, when you compute the three term commutator of three elements of R1, so this is the commutator in the sense of ring theory, where you take xy minus yx for the commutator and so on. Then, okay, so this is supposed to be a trilinear map, which goes from R1 cross R1 cross R1 to R3. So it's a trilinear map from the vector space to itself. And what it essentially is, is it's like the triple, it's like the vector triple product from vector algebra, right? You take you take x and you multiply it by y dot z and you subtract y times x dot z. 
and the um, the quadruple commutator. So this is going to take values in R four. That's just the you take this and you wedge it with W. So that's the structure of those two maps. Um, and again, the group G. So this is going to be a, a class four nilpotent group. It's just all elements in the algebra with unit constant term. Okay, so um, the first claim that that I make is that um, if you look at the if you look at D two of this group, that's bounded away from zero. Um, so why is that? Well, first, so we want to look at the triple commutator, and first you look at it modulo R four, and it essentially looks like this. You end up looking at this vector triple product. Um, and you can just see that, for instance, if x and y are fixed, then for this to be zero, z only has to be orthogonal to x and y. So that's like a one over p squared shot. So there's a one over p squared chance that this triple that the triple commutator falls in R four, and R four only has size p. So there's a altogether there's a one over p cube shot that this triple commutator is trivial. Um, on the other hand, I claim that um, G is not class three by bounded. And the reason is the structure of this uh, quadruple commutator. So no matter what um, bounded index subgroup you pass to, you cannot kill off this, this quadrilinear form. If you look at any bounded index subspace of R1, you can always find four vectors such that this, um, this quadrilinear form is non-zero. So that shows that it's impossible to pass to a bounded index subgroup, which is class three. Okay, um, so that's the example. And now I want to describe um, how we actually prove the positive results. So the positive result says that the structure of the group is bounded by class three by bounded. So the proof um, uh, consists of a number of steps. And um, so what are we allowed to do in a step? So we recall that we're starting with this group, which has D2 bounded away from zero. And what you're allowed to do in any step is you're allowed to pass to a bounded index subgroup, or you're allowed to quotient by a bounded, index, a bounded size subgroup. And the goal is to get from our group G to a class three group in boundedly many steps. Um, and uh, so broadly speaking, um, these are what the, what the sub goals are. So we start with our group, which has D2 bounded away from zero. And in the first step, we're, we want to get to a group which, is, which satisfies something we call the covering condition. So I'll explain the covering condition in a moment. Um, and in the next step, we want to get from a group satisfying this covering condition to a soluble group. Um, and also still satisfying the covering condition. So the, the covering condition will actually turn out, will actually be invariant under um, passing the subgroups or quotients. So once you have the covering condition, you never, you never lose the covering condition. Um, so we want to get to a soluble group and moreover a soluble group of bounded derived length. The next step we want to get from that soluble group to a nilpotent group, and a nil, in fact, a nilpotent group of bounded class. Then finally, we starting with that nilpotent group of bounded class, we want to get to a class three group. So that's, that's the broad outline. So let me explain um, each of those steps in a little more detail. In the first step, we want to get from a, from a group which has D2 bounded away from zero to the covering condition. So this is, this is what comes out if you just take the proof of Peter Neumann's theorem and you try to replace the the commutator with the triple commutator, just naively. Um, and what comes out is you can pass to a subgroup which has this, which has this covering condition. The covering condition says that um, if you look at all commutators in the group, that's the set of all commutators, not the, not the commutator subgroup, then that is contained in the product of two subsets. The, it's, the first factor is um, the set of all elements with the most n conjugates. And the second uh, factor is just some set of bounded size. So in terms of this um, metric viewpoint that I mentioned before, where you think of the number of, con the number of conjugates function as some sort of metric on the group, 
then um, what this is saying is that the set of all commutators is contained in boundedly many balls of bounded radius. So it's like a metric entropy statement about the, about the set of all commutators. Um, and uh, one, one interesting point about this covering condition is that um, it makes sense for infinite groups. Um, I'm no longer talking about the proportion of, of, of anything. So um, from now on, G can be an infinite group so long as it satisfies the covering condition. So this is, this is a little bit analogous to um, uh, the BFC theorem from this point on. Okay, so in the, in the second step, we want to get from this covering condition, a group satisfying the covering condition to a soluble group. Um, uh, so the covering condition, as I said, it says that um, the set of all commutators is contained in boundedly many balls of bounded radius. And a good model case for this condition is when there's just one ball. So if the set S is just the identity, then what this says is that this, um, every commutator in your group has at most n conjugates. So this, this is weaker than the, than the condition in the BFC theorem. The, the condition in the BFC theorem says every element should have at most n conjugates. Now we're just supposing that every commutator has at most n conjugates. So um, groups satisfying um, that condition were studied in a, a paper by Deerings and Shumyansky. And this, this, this paper is actually the reason why we started working together. I saw this paper and I, I thought that um, their result would be relevant to studying these probabilistically class two nilpotent groups. Um, so the case where S is just the identity is, is this previous result of Deerings and Shumyansky. So we, we adapt that argument and we also use induction on the size of S. So we gradually reduce the number of balls that, um, that cover the set of commutators, essentially. Um, in the, in the during Shumyansky paper, I think the, they, they show that if you have a group in which all, in which commutators have the most N conjugates for some bounded N, I think what they show, um, if I remember right, is that uh, the group is um, virtually metabelian. So they essentially get to soluble derived length two. Um, and in this, and in this uh, extension of their argument, I think we get to derived length four or something like that. Um, okay, so we're, so we've got to a, a soluble group of bounded derived length. And now we want to get to a nilpotent group. Um, one of the tools in this section of the argument is um, Hall's criterion for nilpotency. So if you remember what this says, it says if you have a, if you have a group G with the subgroup H, then G is nilpotent if and only if H is nilpotent and if G mod H prime is nilpotent. Um, so um, we use this, um, this uh, criterion for nilpotency due to Hall. And that combines well with um, induction um, because it allows us to assume that G is a meta is metabelian by induction on the um, on the derived length. So we can assume that G is metabelian. Um, and in this case, we what we do is we use a we we actually use um, Peter Neumann's theorem in this part of the argument. So, or we use an asymmetric version of Peter Neumann's theorem. So what does the asymmetric version say? It says, if you've got two subgroups of your group, and if the, the proportion of elements in the, you take a random element of the first group and a random element of the second group, and you ask what's the probability that those two elements commute, and if that's bounded away from zero, the, the conclusion is that you can pass to a bounded index subgroup of each um, in such a, such a way that the, the commutator of those two subgroups is, is, has bounded size. Um, okay, so we use um, that asymmetric version. And the other um, ingredient we use is this uh, angle identity. So actually what we show is that we, we can identify a, a subgroup which satisfies the angle identity of bounded length. And um, then we use that to, to, to show that the subgroup is actually nilpotent of bounded class. So I, I haven't gone um, too much into the details there for lack of time, but maybe given you 
uh, a taste of the ingredients. Um, and finally, we want to get from a group of which is nilpotent and bounded class down to actually class three. And um, in this case, we can use induction on nilpotency class. Um, and that allows us to assume that G is nilpotent of class four. So, so what do I mean by this? Like if you, if you start with a group which is nilpotent of class 10, then I can just quotient by uh, gamma four and do the argument there. That will be a, a group of which is nilpotent of class four. And if my con conclusion is that I can get to a class three group, then in, in terms of the big group, that looks like a, a group which is nilpotent of class nine. So if, as long as I can do the, the class four, um, case, then the, the whole tower collapses, if you like. Um, and if G is nilpotent in the class four, then what I can do is I can look at the, the, the quadruple commutator and I can view this as a quadrilinear map and use multilinear algebra. And this, um, this quadrilinear map um, has harsh restrictions because I'm assuming that the, the triple commutator um, is uh, is trivial a positive proportion of the time. So basically, we use multilinear algebra to study this quadrilinear map and show that these harsh restrictions um, uh, are are harsh, and that allows us to pass through class three um, subgroups. So that's 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 a, in very rough outline um, the steps in the proof. Um, so let me uh, just finish by um, um, doing some speculation. So obviously we think that um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We would like to study the sort of probabilistically class K nilpotent groups. So what do I mean? I mean, you take a, a K plus one um, term commutator and you say, Let's 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 say that um, a positive proportion of all k plus one term commutators are trivial. What can we say about the structure of the group? And um, it may be true that um, in this circumstance, G has a subgroup H which has bounded index, and such that gamma k plus two is bounded. So it may be true that we always have this large section which is of class k plus one. Um, um, that could be true, or maybe I maybe I should be a little bit more conservative and um, and guess that we always get this section which is a class two k minus one. So there, there's some precedent um, for having to double the class. So there's um, there's this uh, classical result of Hall about virtually nilpotent groups, um, which uh, I think if you're finite by class K, then you're virtually class 2K or something like that. So there's some precedent for having to double the class and it's a little bit plausible that um, one has to double the class in this sort of structure result. But it's, it's hard for me to tell what is the right conjecture in general um, because we only have established the case K equals, uh, K equals two and it's hard to tell whether four is two plus two or if it's two times two. So, um, okay, and finally, I'll just remind you of the two problems that um, Michael Larson mentioned yesterday. So we could ask much more generally, um, you take any word W in any number of letters in the free group, and you say the W degree of the group is just the probability that, it's the probability that W is, is the identity. So you take X, Y, Z, and so on at random from the group, and you plug them into the word, and you say the probability that that word is trivial, that's the W degree. And there's a question due to Dixon, which is would be the analog of the 5 a theorem, if you like. So it says, suppose W is not an identity on G, does that imply that the W degree is, is bounded away from one? It's a most, some constant that only depends on the word, not, not on the group, which is strictly less than one. And then at the, at the bottom, bottom end of the spectrum, there's a question, um, of Larson and Shalov, which says that if W is a little bit of an identity, so if the W degree is bounded away from zero, does that imply that there is some actual identity W prime? And W prime 
is allowed to depend on W and on epsilon, but of course not on G. So those are those are two very general questions that um, we've made pretty pretty little progress on in general, and maybe and my feeling is that probably the answer to to both these questions is no, even for one variable letters, but um, that's pure speculation. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. I hope people can hear me, David. David? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Sean, for your interesting talk. We have about um, nine minutes uh, for any questions, comments, whatever. And otherwise, we will come back at uh, 440. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to figure out the times here. Uh, 3.50 Israeli time. What? Three, it's 3.50. The next time is 3.50 Israel time. And that'll be uh, Chloe Perrin. If there are no questions, we could just have a break and people can go out and refill their coffee. Um, I, I, I have a quick question. Do you hear me? What? Yes. Do you hear me? I have a quick question. Um, okay, yeah, uh, there. Um, uh, is there a chance, uh, or have you thought about kind of very short, Words, but not the kind of uh, multilinear, like sort of like the, the um, or analog of multilinear, like commutator in, in uh, different variables. For example, the two-angle word x y y. Um, do you see a way? Yeah. Um, so I haven't looked at it personally, but um, uh, Urban Yazunek, who um, who I worked with on another thing. Um, he and some co-authors worked on, looked at precisely the the angle word, oh. and um, I can't remember exactly what they proved, but um, of the angle word of arbitrary length, or I think it was the two. Angle, I think it was the two angle word. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, it seems to be another tractable case. The angle Wait, word. So it's a paper on on the yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe if uh, if if you can later <laughs> it will yeah. convince you send to, send it to me. That, that yeah, would be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're we will come back and it says seven minutes on my watch. Uh, then. Excuse me. I have a small question for, for the organizers. For this afternoon, would it be possible to give co-host rights also for this device of mine? So I have connected through two computers, and I have uh, uh, co-host um, rights only on one of them. Nobody's around. The organizer. Nobody from organizers. Uh, uh, yeah, there, I'm, or, I'm, I'm, yes. yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. And um, I, I, so, so you have a, um, a technical problem to connect to Zoom. I, no, no. I, I, I settled my technical problem, so I hope it's uh, all right. But I want to use two devices. I have connected now from the two, and I, uh, I, I see that I have. I'm given co-host rights on one of them, but actually I need also on this one. I'm you, I used to speak now to share the screen during my talk later this afternoon. So, so I think Shai, Shai is, uh, is... Yeah, which user did you use on the other device? Just this one, I use, you see the one I use right now to speak, 
I would like to, ha to have co-host right to share the screen during my talk. You have a co-host right. No, I don't think so. I try to share. No, only the host can share in this meeting. No, but what's the username of the other device you try you log? No, I, 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 I'm connected with the same name, Anna Erschler, from both of them. Ah, there you are. Okay. Try now. Yeah. As it's if there are no objections, and from the speaker, uh, why don't we begin? um right now is that okay and that's okay with me we just have to hope that people came back from their breaks oh well let's just wait till it's i guess the normal time yeah it's all sort of semi-confused one thing is that uh a the u.s doesn't change to daylight uh to standard time until next week yeah so it would have uh, been too easy otherwise yeah well all of europe and israel most of the rest of the world i've been uh, trying to convince people that we were uh very smart to have the conference this week because that makes the time difference one hour less for me and lance and, well, and I'm and trying John to convince Cashman everybody to say that we knew this all along. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I think. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen. OK, uh, let it let us begin because we're in. Uh, one minute away. Well, I'll give you one more minute. There we are. You can see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. I can see it. Um, our next speaker this morning, this afternoon, is Chloe Perrin of the Hebrew University, who will be talking on homogeneity in torsion free hyperbolic groups. Chloe? Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I hoped for a, a moment that I would be able to give the talk live because the first day was uh, on site in Jerusalem, but I wasn't lucky enough. So, uh, so yeah, here I am on Zoom. But still, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I want to talk about um, homogeneity in torsion-free hyperbolic groups. Uh, so it's a, it's a question that comes from uh, model theory, from first order theory. Uh, and, but I mean, there is very uh, little uh, first order theory in the proof. Um, so, uh, but I will start with some introduction, right? Let me just see how I can move slides. Can, yeah. Okay. And I should mention it's a joint work with uh, Ayala Bayron. Um, well, you'll see her name when uh, the theorem is mentioned. Okay, so um, what's first order logic on the group? It's the study of uh, first order formulas on G. And if you don't know what they are, then you should uh, think of them as generalized equations. So I'm going to define them, but uh, yeah. And equivalently, you can say that uh, studying first order theory on the group is uh, the study of the structure that is given by the by these first order formulas. And by this, I mean that you, you look at um, all the sets that are defined uh, as solution sets of these generalized equations. And just like when you do uh, algebraic geometry, you study the set of all varieties on some field, say. So here you just look at uh, the structure that's given by the set uh, of solutions to these generalized equations. And so that's, that gives you the, what, what is called the definable structure, and you want to study that structure. So here's the plan of the talk. Uh, I first want to uh, give a more precise definition of what these uh, first order formulas are, and then to talk about homogeneity, which is a, a concept uh, that, is, uh, that comes from, this, um, from model theory. Okay, so it's, uh, you say that the group is homogeneous. 
And then I'll, I'm going to give some results about groups that we know are homogeneous and, and groups that we know are not homogeneous. And then I want to talk about the, the question of which um, torsion free hyperbolic groups are homogeneous. Okay, and the, the main result is in fact, the result that I want to talk about today is a kind of classification or which gives some criterion to determine whether um, such a group is homogeneous or not. Okay, but first, uh, we need to understand what homogeneity means. So let's talk about first order formulas um, on groups. So in general, you talk about first order formulas on um, algebraic structures, but or models uh, as they're called in model theory. But we're only going to talk about groups, so I'm only going to define this in the context of groups. So the first, the simplest example of a first order formula on the group is just an equation. So I gave here two examples: um, x y equals y x. Okay, uh, so x and y are, are variables, and they uh, stand for elements of the group. Right. And I give another example of an equation. But then you also allow yourself to take inequations. Okay, so you can require that uh, z squared times y minus one is different from one, is not uh, the trivial element. Um, and then you allow yourself to uh, take conjunction and disjunctions of these equations and inequations. And the last thing that you, uh, the last tool you can apply to create a first order formula is, of course, um, quantifiers. Okay, so here you see I've added, uh, I've, I've made my examples more and more complicated. So, for example, you have a first order formula which says for all y, x, y equals y, x, and x is different from one. Okay, so this intuitively this expresses uh, the fact that x is a non trivial element which lives in the center. Okay, so, okay, in terms of definable sets, equations give you varieties. You can take the complement by taking uh, the, the corresponding inequation, and uh, conjunction and disjunctions are uh, union and intersections, and quantifiers uh, you can obtain by uh, projections and complements, right? So if you like to think more about definable sets, uh, that's what you need to, to do. Okay, so what's important is that, as I said, the variables always represent elements of the group, and they cannot represent integers or subsets of the group. Okay, so you cannot write a first order formula, as I wrote, uh, the formula that I wrote here is not first order because it says for all x, there exists some n such that x to the n equals one. Okay, saying that the group, um, that all the elements of the group have torsion. Okay, that's not first order because here I quantify on integers and not on elements of the group. Um, here I'm trying to write something which says that um, Z is in the commutator subgroup, okay? And, but I don't know how many commutators I need to write Z, so that's not, uh, that's not allowed in the first order formulas. And here there's another example, you can take a look. It tries to express that some subgroup um, is uh, normal, but, um, sorry, that the group is simple uh, and, yeah, but I'm quantifying on subgroups and that's also something that I'm not allowed to do. Okay, so if you look at the formula, okay, uh, there's uh, uh, the, the formula that I wrote here, there, which expresses the fact that Z is a commutator. Okay, you cannot say that this formula is true or not without assigning a value to Z. Okay, so the formula is true if and only if Z is a commutator. So that's what we call a free variable. Okay, it means it's not bound by a quantifier. And in general, we write the free variables of the formula in brackets after the name of the formula. Okay, and if you have a tuple of elements, G1 up to Gn, uh, which satisfy the formula phi, you write, you write it like this. Okay, G models the formula uh, where I've plugged in G1 up to Gn uh, in place of the variables X1 up to Xn. Okay, and the, the definable set associated to a formula with n free variables is a subset of g to the n, the Cartesian power, and it's the set of all tuples which satisfy the formula. Okay, so that's for um, first order formulas. So um, now I can, now I have this, I can uh, define homogeneity. Okay, so first, so what's the point of this first order formula? It's, it's a kind, it's a language, okay? And in which it's a language in which you can express some things, but not some others that were used to express um, in mathematics, 
Okay, so if you take, for example, one element in the group G, you, you take an element G in, the, in G, then you're interested in the properties of G that you can express by a first order formula. Okay, so here are two examples. The first formula expresses the fact um, that G commutes with everyone. Okay, so it's in the center. And the second formula expresses the fact that G is a square. Okay, so these are th things that you can say about an element in first order language. Okay, so uh, this, the collection of all these properties that you can express about an element using first order language is called the type of G. Okay, so, so the type of uh, little g in the group G is the set of first order formulas with one free variable uh, such that G satisfies uh, 5G. Okay, and, I, and, and I've now given you a definition just for one element, but if you have a tuple, you can say the same thing. Okay, and, and there the type of a tuple will also um, contain the possible relations between the elements. Okay, so, so it contains more than just the type of each one of the, of the GIs. Okay, so the type of the tuple uh, G1 up to GL is the set of first order formulas with L free variables such that G satisfies um, phi of G1 up to GL. Okay, so these are the properties of the tuple that we can express by a first order formula. Okay, so in terms of definable set, maybe I'm, I'm going to stop giving the analogy uh, every time, but you can also you can think of, uh, of a tuple, okay, sitting somewhere in the Cartesian uh, power of G. And you have your definable structures, which are all these definable sets. And the type of the tuple it's, is all the definable sets that contain this tuple. Okay, so it's a collection of, of neighborhoods, if you want, of this uh, tuple. So uh, a remark, an important remark is that if you uh, apply an automorphism of G, okay, uh, definable sets are preserved by this. So if you think about this, so first think about a, a definable set defined by an equation, okay? So the set of solution to an equation in the group will be preserved by automorphism of the group. Okay, here I re remember that the equations have no, um, how do you say, have no um, constants, right? It's just uh, equations. Okay, so if, if a tuple satisfies an equation, then it's imaged by an automorphism of the group will also satisfy the equation. And that's also true for inequations. Also, if you take uh, conjunction of the, and disjunctions of this and, and quantify it. Okay, it's a bit, you have to think about it uh, maybe half a minute more, but that's also true. Okay, so it means that if you take a tuple of elements and you apply to it an automorphism sigma of the group, then the tuple that you get, the image, will have exactly the same type. It will satisfy exactly the same uh, first order formulas. Okay, so if you take a tuple, apply an automorphism, you get another tuple which has um, the same type. Okay, and the question is, is the, the converse true? If you know that, you have, that two tuples have the same type, can you guarantee that there's an automorphism sending one to the other? So that's exactly the question of homogeneity, okay? So you say that a countable group G is homogeneous if for any uh, size of tuple, whenever two tuples have the same type, whenever they, you cannot distinguish them from, um, with first order language, then there is an automorphism sending one to the other. Okay, so it's not true in all groups, but uh, uh, some groups have this property that, that having the same type is the same as being uh, in the same orbit by the automorphism group. Then if you think in terms of definable sets, we said that the type of a tuple is the uh, collection of all the um, definable sets containing it. Okay, and the question is if you have two tuples which are exactly in the same definable sets, so it means that the intersection of the definable sets containing them is, is the same, um, then they are in the same orbit. So, uh, so it means that the inter intersection of all the definable sets containing a given tuple, so in general, it always contains the orbit of the tuple, but the question is, is it equal to the orbit of the tuple? Okay, so just a word about why do I, um, why do I add the word countable 
in countable group is homogeneous um, because if the if the group is not countable like in in model theory the definition of homogeneous requ requires looking at um, infinite tuples okay so in general you look at tuples that have size um, strictly less than the cardinality of the group okay so in this case it's just a finite tuple it's just but in, in any case we, we're only going to consider um uh, countable groups today, so even finitely generated. So, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, homogeneity. So, now let me give uh, some results which are known. So, here are some uh, homogeneous groups. So, the first is um, finite groups. Okay, it's a nice exercise in first order logic to see if you understood what you can do with first order formula. Um, to prove that finite groups are um, homogeneous. Yes, you take, you know, to show that if you have two elements, say, or two tuples of elements that satisfy exactly the same uh, formulas, you can send one to the other by some automorphism. Uh, the next step, it's a harder, slightly, or well, harder exercise to prove that that's also true of finitely generated abelian groups. Okay, so there you need to use a few tricks, but it's not it's not complicated. And uh, a few years ago, um, maybe ten years ago, uh, we proved together with Rizos Sklinos and uh, Uldusim gave an independent proof of the fact that uh, that free groups, finitely generated free groups, are homogeneous. So that's already um, uh, much heavier, I and mean, it's definitely not an exercise. Um, and using, um, okay, and, and in, in that same paper where we proved that free groups are homogeneous, okay, we also proved that, in fact, if you look at the surface group, okay, uh, so the fundamental group of a closed surface, um, as long as it's complicated enough, let's say genus three and above, you can also look at non-orientable uh, surfaces, but, and, and most of these surface groups are not homogeneous. Okay, so, so that's, that was interesting because um, you can think of homogeneity as a result which says that the group has lots of automorphisms, okay, compared to, to the precision with which you can describe elements with first order logic, okay, but in general it says, okay, if you have lots of automorphisms, there's more chance that the group will be homogeneous. And, and there's a lot of um, analogies between the automorphism group of the free group and the automorphism group of surface groups. But in that case, they're not the same, okay? They're not, they don't have the same, um, the same power, if you want. Okay. So I'll give an idea of, of how the proof of this uh, second result goes of, about surface groups uh, in a bit. Uh, but first, let me talk about, um, yeah, okay, I don't remember what comes, comes next. So, <laughs> so we're gonna talk about now the uh, main result, which is, uh, uh, the, how, how you can det determine whether a torsion-free hyperbolic group is homogeneous or not. Okay, so free groups and um, fundamental groups of closed surfaces are uh, examples of torsion-free hyperbolic groups. And so what we wanted to do was to generalize and say, okay, we have these examples of hyperbolic groups which are homogeneous, the free groups, and this example of uh, hyperbolic groups which are not homogeneous, the surface groups and so how can we yeah what, what about the rest of the hyperbolic groups uh, okay so let's see yeah. okay so um so actually what we found out is that uh there's three possible obstructions to homogeneity and and if none of these three obstructions occur then the group is homogeneous okay so that's uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about the proof later, but first, um, okay, so to explain how, uh, what can be an obstruction to homogeneity, I have to, get, to say a word about um, elementary embeddings, which is, again, a concept that comes from um, model theory, so from first order logic on groups. So suppose you have a subgroup H in your group G, okay? And now you take an element H of the subgroup, of the small group, and you look at its first order properties on H and on G. Okay, so it's type on H and it's type on G. 
And these are not necessarily the same. Okay, so for example, if you look at the formula which says that um, H commutes with everyone, okay, it might be true in the subgroup, but not in the B group. Okay. And okay, alternatively, if you if you look at the at the formula which says that the element is a square, maybe it's true in the big group, but not in the small group. Okay, so the type uh, depends on which group you look at, right? Um, so then it it brings uh, uh, the following definition, which is uh, an embedding which which respects the type. Okay, so we say that the embedding in H is elementary if in fact, the types are all the same. Okay, so if for any k tuple h1 up to hk of, of h, the type of h1 up to hk in G is the same as its type in h. Okay, so if you want desire the natural uh, embedding class for um, when, when you look at the, at, at, uh, let's say, the definable structure of a group. Okay, so. So that's an elementary embedding. And, and here is an, uh, an idea of about how you can find, how you can prove that the group is not homogeneous. Okay, so suppose that you have a finitely generated uh, elementarily embedded subgroup H of G. Okay, so it's a subgroup so that the types of the elements in the subgroup are the same whether you look at it, whether you look at them on H or on G. So suppose you have a subgroup like this, and you have an automorphism of it, which does not extend to an automorphism of G. Then G cannot be homogeneous. Why is this? So we assume that H is finitely generated. So let, let's take a generating tuple for H, H1 up to Hm. Now you have your automorphism of H. Okay, so apply it to your generating tuple, you get sigma of H1 up to Hm. And because it's an automorphism of H, you know that the type is preserved. Okay, so the type of the original tuple is the same as the type of its image in H. Okay, but now types in H and, and in G are the same. So you can replace the H that you see here uh, on the type by G, okay, because H is elementary. So looking at the type of H, of H1 up to Hm in H or in G doesn't make a difference. Okay, so also in G, the types of H1 up to Hm and its image by this automorphism of H are the same. But here, if you manage to find an automorphism of G, this now, which sends uh, H1 to sigma of H1 and Hm to sigma of Hm, you will have found exactly an extension of sigma. Okay, and, and we said that sigma is an automorphism which does not extend. So if G were homogeneous, we would get an automorphism from G to G, which sends this tuple to this one, okay? And that would exactly give you an extension of sigma. Okay, so, so now that I've done that, uh, essentially I've, I've um, reduced the question of homogeneity. Well, okay, it, it's, just, it, it's just an obstruction to homogeneity, but now it's a question about Finding, okay, you have to know about elementary subgroups, but once you know that, it's just a question about whether you have automorphisms which extend or not. Okay, so we kind of translated something of in first order logic into uh, a question about automorphisms. Okay, so what do we know about elementary subgroups? Um, so, for example, uh, uh, Tlilcela and Karlampovic and Miasnikov proved that if you look at the canonical embedding of a free group of rank M in a free group of rank N uh, for N greater than M, that's an elementary embedding. Okay, so the canonical embedding is just, uh, you know, take a basis for Fm and extend it to a basis of F. Okay, so if, if Fm is a free factor of Fn, then the embedding is elementary. Okay, so that's uh, one thing we know. And in the case of surface groups, uh, here's another theorem, which also follows from uh, Sela's work. Um, and it says, it gives you uh, elementary subgroups of, um, of uh, surface groups. Okay, so suppose uh, sigma is some oriented hyperbolic surface, okay, like the one I drew here. 
And if you have a subsurface um, sigma zero, so for example, like the one I drew here, uh, such that sigma retra retracts on sigma zero. Okay, so here essentially, like I drew it. Um, okay, if I if I if it's of, uh, of of this type, then I just need to have, let's say, more genus on on in the complement of sigma zero than in sigma zero. Okay, but there are some more complicated examples. But okay, you need to have a retraction of the surface on sigma zero. Then the fundamental group. Okay, here it should be zero. Sorry. Okay, so the fundamental group of this subsurface, okay, it's a subgroup of the fundamental group of the whole surface, and it is elementary in, uh, in pi one of sigma. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah. So, and in fact, to prove, uh, and in fact, this, this uh, subgroup will help us prove that this surface group is not homogeneous. Okay, the proof that surface groups, that most surface, group, for surface groups uh, are not homogeneous uses the obstruction that, that we described with the elementary subgroup uh, that I drew here. So that's what we're going to do uh, now. Right. Okay, so let us prove that the fundamental group of this surface is not homogeneous. So we said that the fundamental group of sigma zero is uh, elementary in the whole surface. That's a big theorem that we use, uh, that, that, that we use, okay? So if we want to apply the obstruction, to, okay, to find an obstruction of the, of the, of the type that we des described before, we need to find an automorphism of uh, pi one of sigma zero that does not extend to, uh, to pi one of sigma, okay? So how do we do that? So that's the claim. There are automorphisms of pi one of sigma zero that do not extend to pi one of sigma. So in fact, pi one of sigma zero is just a free group because it's the fundamental group of a surface with boundary. So that's always a free group. Okay, and I drew here um, a curve. And so the homotopy class of this curve is an element of the fundamental group. Well, I need a base point, but yeah, okay. Uh, and, and this curve is a primitive element. So it's, you can extend alpha to a basis. Okay. Um, and so you have, so this group is a free group. It's a, an elementary subgroup of pi one of sigma and you have this primitive element in it. Okay, so now if you take, if you look at pi one of sigma zero, it's just a free group. So you can send any primitive element to any other primitive element because, by an automorphism because automorphisms just send bases to bases. Okay. And on the other hand, if you look at automorphisms of the whole group, of the whole surface group, okay, because these automorphisms come from homeomorphism of the surface, any element that corresponds to a simple closed curve will be sent to an element that also corresponds to a simple closed curve. Okay. So if you want, because the automorphism group of pi one of sigma, of the big group has to respect this um, uh, topology, okay? Then it has less uh, room for maneuver than the small, than the automorphism group of the small group, which is just the automorphism group of a free group, okay? And, and, so, the, and so the last, the last uh, point that I need to finish my proof is that uh, there are some primitive elements in, uh, in, in pi one of sigma zero, which do not, do not correspond to a simple closed curve. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna say, state this as a fact, it's uh, not too hard to, uh, to see, but yeah. Okay, so, so there is uh, an automorphism of pi one of sigma zero, which sends alpha to something which is not a simple closed curve, okay? Because it's just an automorphism of the free group, I can send alpha to any other primitive element. So I choose to send alpha to a primitive element, which is not a simple closed curve. And then it means that this automorphism cannot extend because any automorphism of the whole surface of the whole surface group will send uh, uh, alpha to an element corresponding to a simple closed curve. Okay, so this, this shows that um, surfaces are not homogeneous. And why did I give this proof? Because uh, uh, well, first to demonstrate, like, the, the, to give an example of this obstruction that I talked about, and also because um, the proof in the of, of the three obstructions in the torsion in the general hyperbolic case are uh, a bit similar. 
Okay, so now uh, about uh, general hyperbolic groups. So the uh, the three criterions that we give for uh, non homogeneity of a torsion free hyperbolic group are in terms of the JSJ decomposition of, of uh, the hyperbolic group. So I want to give to say a few words about this. Okay, so whenever you have a freely indecomposable, so let me, I'm, I'm going to state the result only in, uh, well, not even really stated very precisely, but to talk only about the case where G is freely indecomposable. So it cannot be decomposed as a free product. Okay, so whenever you have a group like this, um, there is associated to it, there is a, a canonical connected space, okay, X, which we call the JSJ decomposition of G by some analogy with the JSJ in, in three manifolds. Okay, and this space, so G is the fundamental group of this space. And this space has a, has a standard, like a canonical, it comes um, with the a, with a decomposition uh, into subspaces. So the way of stating it is that you can build this space by um, gluing some cylinders, like I drew here, and some surfaces with boundaries along their boundaries to some disjoint subspaces x1 up to xl. Okay, so now what does this space do? What does it describe? Um, so that's what I express in the following theorem uh, due to Ritz and Sela. So this is the existence decomposition for the JSJ. So you have a connected space uh, so that G is the fundamental group of this space obtained, as I said before, um, such that, so essentially this space helps you uh, describe all the splittings of G as uh, amalgamated products or a chain and extension over infinite cyclic groups. So any splitting of G as, a, as an amalgamated product or an HNN comes from a simple closed curve on one of the cylinders or the surfaces. Okay, so if you look at, if you look at um, this example of, of, of space X, okay, if I take this simple closed curve here and I cut uh, the space along this curve, I can apply Van Kampen lemma and it gives me uh, uh, an amalgamated product decomposition of the fundamental group of this space. Okay, and so this, this space, in fact, encodes all such splittings uh, in this way. So it means you can find any splitting of G as an amalgamated product by cutting along a simple closed curve and, and applying Van Kampen lemma. Uh, and, and you take your simple closed curves on the orange part, so on the surfaces or the cylinders. Okay, and in fact, there are many great properties to this space. So um, any automorphism of G comes from a homeomorphism of X, okay? And, and up to finite index, the group of automorphisms of G is generated by then twists um, about simple closed curves on the cylinders and, and on the surface. Okay, so maybe the details are not so important, but what, what's important is that essentially you can see all the automorphisms of the group on this space. Okay, and as we said, um, our obstruction trick, obstruction to homogeneity, is, is essentially a question about um, about automorphisms. Okay, well, it's, it has two parts. It has like a part about knowing what are the elementary subgroups, and the second part about checking if these elementary subgroups have automorphisms which do not extend. Okay, so. Um, so if you want to answer the question of which hyperbolic groups are homogeneous, uh, you're given a hy hyperbolic group, so let's say a freely indecomposable hyperbolic group G, okay, there are three things you need to check to see whether it's uh, homogeneous or not. So the first obstruction is like this. If you have in your JSJ a proper sub subsurface uh, of, of a surface which retracts with non-abelian image, okay, so I'm switching here between you know, spaces and groups. I hope that's okay. Then G is not homogeneous. Okay, and here the idea is exactly like in the surface case. Whenever you have a retraction like this, okay, then you know that the complement of this subsurface, okay, its fundamental group is elementary in, um, in the fundamental group. Okay, so that's just like in the surface case, except here, in, instead of having a uh, once punctured genus to surface, I have something which is more complicated. Okay, but we know uh, that by, by results of Sela 
that um, that the fundamental group of this x zero here is um, is elementary, but exactly in the same uh, way that we did for surfaces, this group, okay, it, it will have a kind of a free subgroup here, which comes from this leftover part of the surface, and and using automorphisms of this free subgroup, you can find an automorphism of x zero, which does not extend to the whole group. Okay, so that's the first. Um, so that's the that was the first obstruction. Okay, so so now if your group passed the first test, okay, so it has no proper subsurface which retract in that way, you check uh, the second possibility. So uh, suppose you have a surface which retracts in that way. So okay, and and now you look at the uh, so you retract it and you look at the connected components that are left of your space. Okay, so here there's only one connected component. There are some more complicated cases. Okay, so now you look at the connected components and you check whether what you see, okay, the drawing that you have here of the space is also the JSJ of your smaller space. So that might not be the case. It might be that the JSJ of the fundamental group of uh, X zero is more complicated. Okay, that it refines in some way. And because suddenly there are some splittings that you that you couldn't extend to the big group, but now that you don't have this surface to worry about, um, um, yeah, there are some more splittings that you suddenly see. Okay, and in this case, G is not homogeneous. Okay, if, if the if you have a connected component uh, obtained after retracting a surface uh, whose JSJ is not what you see on on the bigger picture. Okay, whose JSJ suddenly refines, then G is not homogeneous. And essentially, the reason is that okay, if you have an, a new surface or, or new cylinders here, you'll be able to have some more dent twists. Okay, so you have some automorphisms here that you didn't see on the bigger picture. So this means that essentially, um, uh, yeah, the, the, this, the fundamental group of uh, X0 has some automorphisms which do not extend. Uh, to the big group. Okay, but so that's the second obstruction. And now, if your group passed the second test, if there are, if whenever you uh, you have surfaces which retract, okay, so they have to be full surfaces because you passed the first test. And whenever you uh, you have a full subsurface which retracts, then what you see is what you get. So the, the JSJ of the connected of the fundamental groups of the co connected components that are left is really uh, what you see on the bigger picture. Then you check the last uh, possible obstruction. OK, and and that's that's a bit uh, more subtle in some sense. OK, so if you have a surface which retracts, then because it passed the first first test, it cannot be a subsurface. It has to be a full surface of the JSJ. Now you look at the connected component, and that's the JSJ of um, uh, of of pi one of x zero because because it passed the second test okay so there's no refinement of the JSJ okay but if you remember the description of the JSJ uh, automorphisms of the group um, they come from homeomorphism of the space okay not only from dent twists so dent twists are good because they described the automorphism group of G up to finite index but but it's not the full automorphism of group um, of of G Okay, and what is left are essentially, okay, so something I said in the description of the JSJ is that, on the other hand, all, auto, all automorphism come from homeomorphism of X. Okay, so what you could have is, okay, so here I, I, um, I uh, described the, the two blobs as X1 and X2. Okay, so you could have an homeomorphism which doesn't come, sorry, an automorphism which doesn't come from a dent twist, but comes from, an home, from a homeomorphism which switches x1 and x2, for example. Okay, so that's you have phi, a homeomorphism of the space, which, uh, well, it has to be a finite order. Okay, and uh, so for example, here it switches these two things. And okay, in, in the drawing that I did, it, does, it cannot extend to x because, uh, well, on, sorry. Okay, on X1, you had a surface which was attached, and on X2, you don't. So if you swap X1 and X2, if you have 
this automorphism, which comes from a homeomorphism, which swaps x1 and x2, you cannot extend it to the whole group because you don't have a, a surface of genus four sitting over x2. Okay. So, um, and, and our result uh, essentially says that, um, yeah, that the, these three obstruction, okay, which all come from this, um, uh, this idea that if you find an elementary um, subgroup, uh, which has an automorphism, which doesn't extend to the full group, okay, are, so these three obstructions are essentially the only obstructions, okay. So I'm, I'm saying essentially because I described them a bit uh, in, in a bit of a simpler way than what they really are, but okay. So, so one part of the proof is to show that uh, these are indeed obstructions. And I think that's, uh, that's what I mainly talk, talked about today. And then of course you have to, to show that um, if none of these obstructions occur, then the group is indeed homogeneous. But I'm not gonna say anything about that. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say for today. Thank you very much. Uh, and <clears throat> are there any questions? Uh, question to Flora. Yeah. Well, so, uh, so the homogeneous groups, they are co cohoptian, right? Um, the homogeneous groups are cohoptian. You mean in general? In general, to me, yeah. Could be. No. Oh, you're thinking because of uh, of this. Uh, well, they're. I guess they're um, maybe elementarily cohoptian. If that means something more. I, I will. I will ask the 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 question, which is you know why I am asking about that. What is known about uh, homogeneity for small constellation groups, because they are part of so. It's highly tightly related to what you are talking about, hyperbolic case. <coughs> yeah. Um, so. So these abstractions for how do they look uh, from the positions of small constellation groups? Because they are all <coughs> all these groups are hyperbolic. So, what is the situation there? From your result follows uh, part of them for sure will be homogeneous, but uh, what about uh, others from the point of view of small constellation? What are the, uh, the the class of these groups? Oh, you you, you want to look at, uh, okay? You want to to restrict the result to small constellation groups and see? Yeah, yes, uh, every small constellation group is hyperbolic so from your result follows that if you yeah if, yeah so it's torsion free torsion free hyperbolic yeah, case, yeah, yeah. Okay. torsion free yeah case so. uh yeah i don't know i haven't thought about this um i mean is you'd have to know something about that their jsj so i don't know yeah maybe maybe that's a reasonable class maybe that's also they uh, still they have uh, homogeneity. I don't know. That will be interesting to figure out from your work how it will look, look like for uh, uh, small constellation. Torsion, yeah, that's, that's torsion free, of course, finitely generated uh, constellation groups. And this is related to cohopianity, by the way, in some sense. But anyway. Okay. Yeah. That, okay. That's a good question. I, I can think about this. Thank you. There are no more questions. We will resume.
um, in about five minutes, six minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone has. <laughs> Anyway, our next speaker is uh, Fom Tiep from Rutgers. And as I say, we will resume in about eight minutes for that. Good morning, Alex, or afternoon. OK. Lance, uh, sorry, I, I, I haven't realized that I am on, in, in mute. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, well, I'm it's a little <laughs> dislocating, but better yeah. uh, this way. Um, <clears throat> you, you, you are in California, I bet. Oh, yes, yes. But you had, because you had, of... You had really uh, to wake up very early today. <laughs> I'm in Princeton. I am, I am in, the, in the East Coast. You're in Princeton, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. David is in Princeton too, so David. Oh, really? Oh, he's now he's now here uh, all the time in this. Yeah. Right. Uh, we should get together. And there is Uzi. I mean, people are missing their afternoon naps. Yeah, right? that's uh, that's and, a serious problem. <laughs> yeah. Me, it's more serious problem than uh, waking up early in the morning. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, you're talking first tomorrow morning, yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's okay. That's that's not. Yeah. Okay. But uh, uh, and, and I, I'm first. I don't remember. I'm early in the morning, but I don't. Remember. Well, at our time. Um, yeah. yeah. But. Uh, Three hours makes a difference. No, uh, it, is, it is a difference. Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, California is neglected. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We should have pre recorded us. Uh, no, but, uh, but I see that you agreed to be the chair. Yeah. Well, yeah, so that's, there uh, seems to have been some confusion. My notes said this morning, and David's notes said I was supposed to do it tomorrow morning, but who knows? We're swapped. Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, we can continue. But how long are you in Princeton uh, now? For the semester. Um, I came in September and I will be till uh, more or less till Christmas. Good, good. All right. I was, um, well, I was, I was back in Israel uh, uh, two weeks ago, just for a few days. Uh -huh. um, I didn't come yesterday to the conference. We had a little drama here. My, I was in New York last week for a conference. My wife was with me and uh, on Sunday, she was supposed to fly to Toronto, our daughter oh. and, uh, uh, and the husband and the kids are there. And then she denied access to the airplane because by mistake, we didn't pay attention. She did the PCR. Oh. You know, and uh, by uh, on Thursday uh, in the evening at uh, 7 p.m. by mistake they gave us the form like it was in 7 a.m. and this was more than 72 hours in advance. Oh God. So it was a real drama because I was already in Princeton so I took a taxi to the airport we tried to get she couldn't pay so we stayed in a hotel in, in, the, La, in the La Guardia and then we rushed in the morning to get her another <laughs> PCR. Oh, it's terrible now to travel. I mean, like each, each I, travel, you need so many better, forms. better to stay put. Um, I, my wife and I 
had were Lynn and I were really looking forward to going to uh, Israel and uh, you know last summer when things yeah. were uh, somewhat better and then I think but I think yeah. now Israel was open I think as of yesterday yeah. I believe Israel was open to foreigner before that it was impossible basically that yeah, and then even they were vaccinated but now I think starting if I understand correctly starting yesterday it's possible well <clears throat> my next door neighbors here in San Diego were going who are Israelis we're going ah, no, Israelis could could yeah. come time. and we're all vaccinated and things like that many times it seems uh we got about two minutes but uh it was unclear for for foreigners going into israel whether they had to quarantine for a day or not no no yeah. yeah for a day but i tell you it's actually in israel i must say it works pretty efficiently what you do they enforce you to take a test right at the airport you cannot get out of the airport without taking the test yeah and they promise you the results by maximum 24 hours and if you have, and and you have to to be in quarantine till you get the results or 24 hours the earlier of the two and usually you get it within few hours so it's not oh. a real problem you know you fill a form where you are you go to the hotel better don't stay there for a few hours you know take a nap <laughs> by the well, time you wake up you will get the results and you are free so it's not a serious problem yeah but. and and uh, i did it when i went then that supplies uh, equally well to israelis and non-israelis i uh, i went uh, when i went to israel i landed around uh, 10 in the morning and i think by 4 p.m i got the results wow that's so pretty good yeah wow. so i mean it's 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 still uh, you know it's a little uh, problem but uh, it's not so terrible anymore yeah you have to right anyway we got one minute yeah how oh, oh, uh, things in... is, where is uh... yeah, where is yeah, yeah, i mean may, may, uh, i mean i can i understand that you don't travel but what about yefim yefim can stay at one place for so long yeah he he is here and talking and uh, teaching Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays oh to, a very, to a huge class. Wow. Um, uh, I don't know. I think the math department, well, anyway, it's huge. Every time I talk to him, his class size gets up. Uh, so <laughs> we, uh, I don't see. Uh, uh chip yet i'm here what i am here see? i've been here ah good morning good morning, good uh, morning. okay so we will begin now uh our next speaker is professor chip from rutgers university who will speak on word maps on simple groups width and distribution Professor Chiep, um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, at this um, um, symposium. And um, yeah, it's, it's an honor and pleasure for me to, to be invited to speak. And it would have been like my third visit to Israel if there wasn't the, uh, the, um, the, the COVID. Um, so I'd like to talk about the world map on seven groups and uh, many results in my talk. Uh, are going to be joined with uh, with uh, Anne and Michael and some also with Bob and um, Martin Liebeck, Bob Uranik and Martin Liebeck and uh, Eamon O'Brien. Um, uh, can you see my my screen? No. You can see my screen, right? Yes, I, we can, or at least yeah. I do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so let me try to make it like full view if I can. Uh, let me see. Oh, right. Uh, full screen mode. Yes, okay. Um, but then I have a, mm, I, I have a problem. Let me see. 
Can I? Okay, so I can do it. Um, so uh, uh, we all know about the um, Larang theorem, which say that every integer is a sum of at most four squares. And then there is a version for the cube, which is due to uh, Wifrish and Kamala, which say that every positive integer is a sum of at most nine cube. Of course, we know that they are like special cases of the classical Wayne problem, which is about to prove that uh, for all positive integers k, there is smallest g a function of k such that every positive integer is a sum of at most g k k powers. Um, so it was proved by uh, David Hinbert in 1909 that uh, this g k exists is a finite uh, number but implicit. And nowadays we know that. Um, that uh, I'm sorry, I don't think that. <laughs> Let me go back to the uh, to the other mode, yeah, uh, because I I, I, need, I need to use my mouse. And uh, so now I know uh, nowadays we know that, that the GK is um, given by some formula for like a two to, to the K plus the um, for a function of one point five to the K minus two for all but finally many values of K. But this is not a, about this problem. They are going to talk, and we want to talk about some non-commuted version of this problem. Um, so, so how do you make it uh, non-commuted? Well, we group theorists would probably like to replace the, the set of n, the set of positive integers by a something which is non-abelian. And maybe the, we can think about the uh, finite non-abelian simple groups, uh, G. So uh, this is area started with the, um, uh, by the, um, Theorem, which is due to uh, Martinez and Zemmerup in 1996, and also independently by Jan Saxon and John Quinson in 1907, which say that for every positive integer k, um, there is a function f of k, there's a number f of k such that if your g is a fine simple group and the exponent of g doesn't divide k, then every element in g is a product of f k k powers. Now, in this uh, uh, result, the FK is implicit, but uh, we can try or oh, we can try to make it uh, explicit later. Also, let me uh, note for later that uh, the condition that your exponent is not it doesn't divide k is related to the fact that if the exponent of the fine simple group G is bounded, well, this is bounded even only if the order of G is bounded. So later on, we we'll talk about the um, why you have to assume that the uh, order of G is uh, large enough. So, uh, so yesterday and also today, you only learned from the talk about Michael and I've shown about the word maps. Um, so, um, so you can realize the uh, wearing problem for powers to any word map. S suppose that you are given an alphabet like x1, x2, xd, then by a word, I mean any non shaven element of the free group um, on the x1, x2, xd, let's say w. And now suppose they have a group G, and then a word map uh, corresponding to W is gonna be the map that go from the uh, Cartesian product G to the D to the G, where you send any G, D2 from G1, G2, GD to the value of W at G1, G2, and GD. And then the question that you are interested in is how big is the image of GD under this map? We have to say W of G instead of the W of G to the D. And then the, um, the non commutative wearing problem is about to study the width of this uh, W. So, for any word W, we'd like to study the smallest C, which is uh, which may be depending on W, which you call the, the width of W, such that for all the fine simple group G of large enough order, G is uh, uh, WG to the C. So, it means that you look at the setup on the product of uh, X1, X2, and X. C where the xi are in the image of, of g under the w. Um, so uh, uh, aside from the, uh, the width, we also want to look at the distribution which is induced by w. So the word map w is going to be inducing the distribution which is denoted by p sub w comma g. So uh, this, um, this distribution um, take the value, well, um, the uh, the side of the, of the fiber over the g to the d for any one element x. Uh, so you get this uh, distribution on g, and the question that you are 
uh, that we are interested in that, that how close it is distribution to the uniform distribution, we take the, um, the one element set x to the one over g. So this is the uniform distribution. Um, so let's look at uh, some example. If you take w of x to, the, to be x to the k, then you go back to the very problem for powers that was studied by Martinez Zemanov and Sachs and Winson. If you take W to, the, to be the commutator word, then uh, we have the old conjecture, which is a theorem after the work of uh, Martin Liebeck, Eamon O'Brien, Anne Shalab, and myself, that uh, the, the commutator map is selective on own phi seven group. Um, uh, we can also mention some motivation for, for the study of word map. So one topological motivation come from the work of uh, um, Nikolai Nikolov and then Siegel on cell conjecture on profile groups. And a geometric motivation come from the, um, uh, the study of the commutator lengths. We call it the width, but uh, geometers call it the commutator lengths for topological groups, like maybe for fundamental group as a manifold. Anyway, so what can you say about the width of word maps? So the first result is due to Martin and Anne in 2001, where they say that this CW exists like a finite number. Um, but everything changed after the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the work of Anne in 2009, where he showed that the, the, not only that CW is a finite number, it actually is bounded by three. So it means that uh, the, um, the cube of the, of the image is equal to G, if G is simple of large enough order. Now, let me come back to the question why we have to assume that, uh, that, the, uh, that G, uh, the simple group has to be a large enough order. So in, in 2011, Kasab of Nikolov, and also later on in a paper of Bob and myself, we show that the, the width can grow unbounded if we don't impose any condition on the order of G. So they mean that for any part of the integer N, you can find a word W and find simple group G such that the, the, um, the image is, is non trivial but yet the end power of the image cannot be equal to G. Um, anyway, so, uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the marvelous result of uh, Anne show that the, uh, the, uh, the wish is bounded by three if your G is large enough. Now, uh, in light of this result, and also in light of the result about the oral conjecture, one could hope that, uh, well, maybe you can improve from three to two, or maybe even to one. But uh, with some more thought, then you see that uh, the, if you take the W of X to be the X square, then the, the width of W is gonna be larger than one uh, because, um, well, okay, that's a, an exercise. Uh, you could also say that, well, uh, if you look at the power of words, then maybe it's too uh, restricted. Uh, but then there's a, a reason due to Jumbo and Martin and Anne, I mean, uh, Ayman, in 2013, where they show that if you take this W to be the word in two variables x and y, which is x squared times the square of the commutator of x into the negative two and y, then uh, then the, uh, the 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 word is not selective on all the group uh, p is n two over the fin of uh, an odd power of three. So so the width is larger than than one. Okay. So there is no way that you can improve, improve the, the bound from three to one. So, so two would be possible. Uh, so from this, and you can see that two would be the, the best possible bound for the width on simple group. And indeed, this is the case. So this is the theorem due to uh, Michael, Anne, and myself. So first we show that on simple group, then the width is bounded by two. And in, in fact, we show that for any non even words, W1, W2, there is a bound N depending on W1, W2, such that if the final Simon group G has order at least N, then the W1 of G times W2 of G is G. So, so any element in the group is just a product of, of one W1 value and a W2 value. Now, you can go out from the Simon groups, go on, and then you can go to the quasi Simon group. Then on, on the quasi simple group, then you can show that the width is at most three. And in fact, the bound three is best possible. Again, we prove that like a, 
a symmetric version of the result, which is uh, the following. So for any three word W1, W2, W3, there is a bound N depending on W1, W, W3, such that if your G is a quasi simple group of order at this N, then W1 of G times W2 of G times W3 of G is equal to G. Um, and uh, then let me make some comment about the, the proof of this result. So everything started from the result of uh, Brand in 1983. So he showed that if, it, if the script G is simple and unbeat group, then the word map WG is uh, dominant. So you mean that the image contains an open dense subset. So therefore, if you look at the, um, uh, the um, square of the image, then it's gonna be equal to G. If your G is, a, is, the, is the group of the F point of your uh, script G over an unreally closed field. So what do you do for the, so for the five simple group of lead type? Well, uh, using the result of Borel and also some uh, algebraic geometry, we can show that the W1 of G and W2 of G is some specific regular semi simple class C1 and C2. And then by using the Frobenius for character formula and some bound on the character values, we can show that the, the product of the class C1 with the class C2 contains all the non-identity element of the group G. So in this way, then you, then you can show that W1 of G times W2 of G is everything in your, in your group. And of course you hit the, the identity trivially. Um, so I would also like to mention uh, some reason due to Hui, uh, Michael Larsen, and Anne Chalet. So they look at the uh, Chevalier group over uh, any fin F. Uh, and suppose that F is infinite, then they show that the, if you look at the force power of the image, then it's gonna be containing all the non-sanctioned element of the group. And they also have some further result when your app is the, is the field of real numbers or the uh, periodic field. Okay. Um, so uh, I mentioned that the, um, that the, um, the upper bound on the width of the uh, power word is, um, is implicit. And also the low bound uh, for the order of the simple group uh, so that the, the width is two, it's also implicit in the result that uh, we talked about before. Um, so can you make it uh, explicit? Um, so now we are going back to powers. Um, and indeed you can do it. So this is a result due to Bob Warnick and myself. So we show that um, if it, for any two integers k and l, if your g is a fine Sieben group of the, at least m to the eight m square, where your m is um, is the larger among the k and an l, then any element of g is a form x to the k, y to the l. So in particular, uh, so the bound on the order of the simple group to make sure that the map x to the m, y to the m is, um, is relative is uh, m to the eight m square. Of course, we don't claim that this bound is best possible. Um, so this is, the, um, this is the explicit version of the result of uh, Mike and Anna and myself for the, for the power maps. Uh, what about the, uh, the result of uh, Martina Zemanov? Well, we can also show that for any positive integer k, if g is five simple group and the exponent of g doesn't divide k to make sure that you have some non trivial k powers, then any element of g is a product of uh, um, at most um, 80 k times the square root of two times log two of k plus 56 k powers. Uh, and again, we don't claim that this number is, um, uh, is, 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 is uh, optimal, but I think that we probably, um, well, um, I, I think that we need something like, a, um, like a, something like the linear in k to make sure that uh, uh, to cover everything every element in the group. Okay, um, so in, in, the, in the above result, so we look at any powers, then, then uh, 
then you see that uh, we have to uh, we have to get some condition on the on the on the simple group to make sure that the the old good map is uh, selective. Um, but for some special powers, then actually you can prove some absolute result, which is uh, which is true for any simple group. Um, so uh, so first, uh, let me mention the result of uh, Bob and Gunther in 2012, which is um, generalizing a previous result due to Martin and uh, Eamon and Anne and myself. So the results say that if your k is a power of a prime or a six, then the word map i to the k, y to the k is selective on all five simple groups. So they mean that any element of any five simple group is a product of two k powers. And in fact, if you look at the k equal to two, then we have a, a, a result which can be viewed like a non-commutative version of Laurent theorem. This is a result due to Michael and Anna and myself, which say that uh, the word map x square y square is selective on every finite quasi simple group. So every element in any quasi simple group is a product of two squares. So we we have something even better than the than the situation for the uh, for the integers where you need four squares, but here you need only two squares. Um, so one may ask, is there anything special about like um, powers of p and powers of six? Six is two times three. Well, we have a a product of two primes, and uh, in fact, there's nothing special about those prime two and three. So. Uh, so in 2018, uh, Bob and uh, Martin and uh, Eamon and Anna and myself, and me, we proved the following theorem. We say that if you have two prime P and Q and uh, let uh, K be P to the A, Q to the B, like in the Bernstein theorem, then the word map I to the K, Y to the K is selective on every five simple group. So, so every element in the in any five simple group is a product of two K powers for this kind of K which is like uh, the, the product of powers of two prime. So certainly this result generated Bernstein P to the IQ to B theorem. And um, one can jokingly think of this theorem like another way to prove the Bernstein theorem. Um, and now, let me mention that this result cannot be generalized to the quasi simple group because if you look at the, the 20th power, then you can show that I to the 20, Y to the 20, doesn't cover um, on the uh, element of SN25. And in fact, this map doesn't hit any element of the phi of SN25. So we cannot realize this to the, to the quasi simple group. Also, if you try to, to look at the product of three or more prime powers, then it doesn't work either. So uh, you can look at the um, I to the 30s and this code map, well, it actually driven on the A5. Well, yeah. So, so there's no way you can you can cover the, uh, the any non-driven element, if, even if you look at like a longer product uh, of uh, 30 powers. Um, so this uh, look uh, very negative about the uh, the product of more than two uh, prime powers, but we can still do something. Um, so. So here's uh, some asymptotic result for more than two prime. Uh, so this result was uh, proved in part by, uh, in the paper with uh, Bob and uh, Martin and Anne and, and, and uh, Eamon. And then it was finished uh, recently by Michael and myself. So we show that there is a function from the positive integer to the positive integer f, such that if k is in the positive integer and k has most d uh, distinct prime factors. Then if we look at the word map, i to the k, y to the k, then this uh, word map is selective on own on the group a n, where your n is f of d, and also on own the simple class and group of rank r, which is at least f of d. So if the rank is big enough, or the uh, degree of the a n is big enough, then, then this um, word map is selective and big it up uh, depends on the uh, on the number of, of listing prime factors of, of k. Um, 
so you you can ask so what happened to the um, uh, to the um, Stephen Gould type of bounded drawing, uh, and this theorem, I mean this statement is formed for this kind of group. So for instance, you can look at the uh, the prime p, and there is uh, there is a result saying that um, this an infinite number of prime p such that p square minus one has at most I think twenty one distinct prime factors. And using that, then you can you can do a counter example to this claim. Uh, so this is the way that uh, that that you can um, that this statement can be true for the group of, of bounded rank. So this is only for the for the group of unbounded rank. And if you want to realize this result to the to the quasi simple group, then it's also false even for the for the group of unbounded rank over field of unbounded size. For instance, you can look at the word map i to the i y to the eight. And this map is not selective on any simplicity group as p to n q. If you take q to be congruent to five mod eight and any odd n. So in a sense, this result is, uh, is an uh, optimal one for, if you look at the uh, word map i to the k, y to the k, where a case is uh, like, uh, like is a product of more than two prime powers. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the proof of these uh, reason for powers. Um, so one of the key ingredients is the following uh, the reason of Bob and myself, which means on previous reason of uh, Gunther, of Jan, and Thomas Weigel, also of uh, Michael and Anne, myself, and another reason of uh, Bob and Gunther. So we showed the following. So suppose that you have a quasi simple uh, lead type group of simply connected type, in uh, characteristic P, then you can find some prime R and S1 and S2 not equal to P and some regular semi simple element X and Y in G such that the order of, of X is R and the order of Y is, um, is, a, is a product of powers of X or S1, S2. And so that the, the class of X and time the class of Y covers every non central element of the group G. Um, so this one ingredient and this uh, this result can can be viewed like as some kind of approximation to the uh, to the Thomson conjecture. And as the second ingredient of our proof, uh, this is dubbed uh, by Martin like the unbreakable approach. And this approach was first used in the uh, in the paper proving the Ori conjecture. So what do you do with the following? So you want to show that your G is a is a product. Uh, up to k powers. So what do you do with that? Uh, you can try to write your g like a commuting product of x with y, uh, which lies in the commuting in the central product of two subgroup a and b. So that the induction apply to the commuting subgroup a and b. And if you can do that, then 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 you can handle g. Of course, what have what happens if g is unbreakable in this way? So if your G is unbreakable in this way, and you show that your G is close to be regular, and therefore the centralizer of, of, of G is very small, and then we can try to handle G by, uh, by Frobenius uh, character formula and also by character theoretic argument. So a lot of these results uh, rely on bound on character ratios. And um, so uh, for this purpose, we need some very strong uh, character bounds. Okay, so so the previous result uh, generalized the Bernstein theorem, and now we can also think about the uh, the odd order theorem of Feit and uh, and Thomson, and in fact you can also generalize this theorem. So uh, Bob, Martin, Eamon, Anand, and myself, we proved that if your k is any odd integer, then the word map x to the k, y to the k, z to the k is selective on every fine quasi simple group G. Uh, and the way you prove it is that, in fact, we show that every element in such a group G is a product of three, two elements. And um, so in many, in most of the cases, you can, you can take these uh, two elements to be uh, regular, uh, semi-simple, if, if, if your G is, uh, is a group in, uh, not in characteristic two, uh, but for some group like a type uh, 
I think E seven or E six, then then you can take um, those elements only to be something which is uh, almost regular. And uh, again, we can um, we can ask what happened uh, if you uh, if you well, instead of three k powers, can you do it with two powers? So can you show that the the width of this is a uh, is two? And the 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 answer is no. Uh, and uh, so this is an optimal because if you look at some word like x to the 165 times y to the 165 power, then this word map doesn't hit any element of the 11 in PSN2 11. Okay, so so we talk about width. So let's go back to the to the distribution. So uh, recall that if you have some word map W, then the uh, the word map induces some distribution P W G, and the question is: so suppose that you already know that W is uh, is selective, so it covers every element in the group, but how uniformly that is cover the element in the group? So we want to know how close is this distribution to the uniform distribution U sub G on the group. Uh, of course, you can try to compare in the N one norm or even in NP norm for any P larger than one, or even in the an infinity norm, which is the, um, yeah, which uh, the norm of any function F, it's just the, um, the order of the G times the maximum of all the values of F on the group element. Uh, and we have to say that a word map W is almost NP uniform uh, on five simple groups. If, uh, when you look at the, the limit, of the NP distance between the distribution and the uniform distribution, when you let the order of G tend to infinity, then the limit is zero. So the question is, which was N1 uniform? So uh, Shelley Garian and Anne showed that the, uh, the X square by square or the uh, commutator word, they are N1 uniform. And um, this result has been realized by by Michael and Anne, where they show that the any in the product of two powers or any admissible words. So they mean that the, the words in which uh, each letter xi appears exactly once at xi and exactly once at xi inverse, then the this um, these words are n one uniform. Then um, in a paper, I think in two thousand nine, uh, Michael and Anne proved some very sharp character bound for the ordering groups. And using this uh, sharp character bound, Michael and Anne also proved that the, that the product ADT, any, any two disjoint words are almost N1 uniform on alternating groups. So what about the, uh, the group of lead type? Um, so so the, the case of the group of, of lead type was considered, considered in the paper of uh, uh, Michael, Anne, and myself where it shows that if W1 and W2 are the two disjoint words, then the product of W and W2 is almost N1 uniform. Um, so the result has um, uh, seven consequences. For instance, if you combine the result with uh, another result of Ma Martin and Anne in 1995, then you, you can get that. If you W in any such word, then uh, almost every element of any five simple group G uh, I have the form W of G1, G2, and GD, where you can take the G1, G2, and GD in such a way that uh, any two of them generate the group G. So this is about the N1 uh, uniformity. What about NP, where your P is larger than one? Um, so it turns out that the, the high uniformity fell. And even when you look at a longer product, not only the product of of two words, but if you look at any long product of any number of disjoint words, uh, for instance, you can look at the, uh, the the long product of power words, x1 to the n, x2 to the n, k to the n, and if you take n to be larger than k plus two, then then this um, this um, this is not NP uniform for for some p larger than one. And if you look at this example, then you see that the the disjoint words x1 to the n so and I k to the n, they are all have the length n. And here you, you see that n is larger than the number of, of the disjoint factors. 
So it turns out that uh, what matters is the length of the disjoint factor WI in your W. So in the same paper with uh, uh, Michael and Anne, we proved that um, so if you that uh, well if you if you you can make sure that the number of the of the factors is much bigger than the the length of the, of each of the factors, then everything is okay. So the explicit result is the following. So for any L, let take n of n to be two times ten to the eighteen times n to the fourth. So this number is it's rather large. So if your W is any product of n, which is at the n of L, this joint words, each of length at most L, then, then the W is an infinity uniform. So they mean that if you look at the limit when the order of the simple group tend to infinity of the n infinity distance between the, the distribution induced by W and the uniform distribution, then this is zero. Okay. Um, so this is uh, what you can say about the, um, the uh, distribution. Now, you, you can see that in all this problem, if you try to prove some reason which uh, would be true for all the five simple group, then the bottleneck is the, is the word W, non even word W, where somehow W of G is just one for, for some five simple group G. So you can ask the question, if you, if you assume that the W of G is non even on all five simple group, so you mean that W is not an identity on any five simple group, can you bound the, uh, the width uh, universally for, for all five simple group G? Um, so to answer this question, we, we uh, get, uh, so we de define the notion of the characteristic collection of subset. So a collection of subset S of G in G, one for each finest group G is called characteristic if, uh, if the image of SG under any homomorphism from G to H, it contains S of H. And the collection is gonna be called ample if you, uh, if uh, on any fine simple group G, S of G has at least two elements. Okay, so you certainly have has one in there. So you want to have some non identity element in the S of G. So here are some examples of characteristic collection. You, if you have any word map W, then you can take S of G to be the image of, of, the, of the word map. You can also look at the, the setup on the, um, on the element of our dividing K. So we take R W to be I to the K, and you take S of G to be the W inverse of one. And then we define the characteristic carving number, C, C, N of G, to be the infimum of on the N such that for any ample characteristic collection S1, S2, Sn, the product of the S1 of G, S2 of G, Sn of G is equal to G. Um, so what it, can you say about the uh, characteristic covering number of any five simple group? And the result, which uh, Michael and Anne and myself uh, and, and me prove is that if G is any five simple group, then the, um, then the CCN of G is at least at most, I'm sorry, it's at most six. As a corollary, you can show that if you take uh, W1, W2, W6 to be six disjoint words, and none of the WI is an identity on any five sequence group, then the, uh, the word W1, W2, W6 is serrated on all five sequence group. Um, so why six in this result? Well, it's because of our proof that uh, so the proof goes like this. So first you take any 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 two set S1 S2, then you show that the uh, the product of these two set hit a nice class C, and and we want to have a, a nice class so that we we can uh, use the result by Bob and myself to to see that the uh, the cube of it is equal to G. So therefore two times three is six, and therefore you can show that the W the S1 of G times S2 of G times S6 of G covers everything. Um, we can also note that the uh, CCN of G is, uh, is bounded by ECN of G minus one. Well, what is the ECN? ECN is the extended covering number. And there are many known results on ECN by, uh, uh, by many colleagues from Israel, uh, Arad, Herzog, uh, Diesel, and other people. 
Um, so in some cases, if you know that ECN of G is small, then then and then automatically you get that CCN of G is also small. Um, now, if G is the only group, then you can actually show that the, the CCN of G is at most four, and in fact, it's equal to three if your N is large enough. I should mention that uh, in many results concerning the only group, including this result, uh, we, we use the result of Bertram in 1972, <coughs> which, which, uh, which is like a marvelous result, which show that if you look at the uh, some element in the AN or SN, which are some second of large enough length, then the product of all the conjugate, uh, or I mean the, the product of the conjugate of this uh, element is gonna be covering every uh, permutation. So it's a, it is a very nice result, which uh, would be very hard to prove using the character but mm, theoretic method. Um, now, uh, so we, we we see that the uh, the uh, the CCN of AN is um, mostly is three. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the SI, which is the um, the set of the um, of the evolution. Then you see that for this uh, for this kind of collection of subset, then the width is just the involu involution width. So uh, we want to write every element of the group is like the product of involutions. And you want to know what is the smallest number of involution would be like, uh, what would be the smallest length of the product would be enough. So this is the notion of the involution width. And the result of uh, Alice Malcolm is that the the uh, the involution width is at most four for all five Simon group, and in fact four is the best possible that is, that that you can do, and this is due to a result of Knuckle and Nielsen in 1991. So using this result of Knuckle and Nielsen, we can show that this in fact CCNFG is equal to four for infinitely many five Simon group. So you can. In, in particular, you can look at the PSN and Q where your N at least five, where N also is co-prime to Q minus one and Q is large enough compared to N. So for all those simple group, the CCN of G is equal to four. So of course the question is, um, can you improve the bound of Mike and Anna and myself from six to four? So it is true that the CCN of, of any simple group is at most four. And also, can you find a five simple group G such that the CCN of G is actually larger than the involution width of your G? So, of course, if there is no such a simple group, then, then of course you know that CCN of G is bounded by four. Um, so, um, so these questions are open. And of course, if you have any thought about it, that would be great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, uh, yeah, may I ask, Tip, uh, may I ask you, um, I was listening to you and, and uh, recall something which once I really wanted to know. And it's, a, it's about a dual question, right? namely, you can think of the world, the image of the world map in the following sense that it's a world in the free group, and you look at all possible epimorphism, epimorphisms from the free group to the to G, and you look, what is the image of that world? I want to ask you about a different, a, a, a kind of a dual question. T take the free group, fix an epimorphism from the free group to G. And, uh, and there is a subset of the free group. I'm mainly interested in the primitive elements. And I ask, what's the image of the primitive elements under that uh, specific epimorphism? Can you see a starting point to under such a question? For example, even this, I don't know. Is it always that the image of the primitive elements is also on two? Okay, so. Uh, 
So you fix the map. And you fix the epimorphism, and then you look at all possible and all the primitive elements. So in a way, this is like you 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 start with an element and you and you apply on it all the Nielsen transformations on that element. So it takes you certainly to all its conjugacy class, and it takes you much more. But can you get to all other elements? So it's it's related to this Nielsen type problem about Nielsen classes and things like that. But for final simple groups, it will be interesting. This this will be related to some questions in other direction, which will, when we'll meet, I will tell you. It's that yeah, sure. Happen. I think that uh, yeah, I I'm not sure that what I can say right now, but I think that is really. Yeah, maybe if you, yeah, you are here, so so maybe on someday we yeah, I I yeah. I <laughs> you mean you. that we are, we bought not here in Israel, but in uh -huh. Oh yeah, by by here I mean that you are you are you are in, in prison this semester. So I hope <laughs> that you talk more about this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look. Are there any other questions? If I have not, a question to yeah. So uh, there is a so the, for uh, or there is a result for uh, or a conjecture that says that or a conjecture we need one commutator, and there is a counterexample, which you by Yambor and Liebeck and well, I forgot was the third that there is a word. There is a word which does not cover PSL2 or some fancy field. That's right. Yeah. So I think the word is like a I squared. Yeah, I mentioned in my talk that the yeah, you look at the I squared times the square of the commutator. Yeah, up uh, so, I, I, uh my square and, uh, and y. Yeah. So the yeah, yeah so, so the, the paper of uh, Jumbo and uh Liebig and uh, O'Brien. Yeah. O'Brien. So the question is. What will happen if we close the field? Will this map will be on subjective? I mean, on the algebraic group. Mm. The point is that up to now there are no counterexamples for uh, words which are not subjective on PSL2 of the algebraic field, with the algebraically closed field old problem difficult and is it clear uh, I don't know yeah I am um, I'm yeah I, I I don't know what happened if you take the uh, if you take the same word and if you look at the psn2 q uh, I mean a psn2 over the, the closure I the closure uh, yeah Maybe, maybe, the, maybe this counterexample says that that in this particular group, uh, PSL mm -hmm. two, if we yeah, take yeah. a nice group, so so if, uh, let's take PSL two, and then if we want to cover this uh, group by one word, and then maybe uh, we should restrict ourselves by some class of fields, maybe three. Uh, this particular field is a counterexample, but in many other cases it will be on. Maybe maybe the problem is the field there. Maybe the, we still have can have one, but for some particular class of PSO2 groups over some fields. Well, pa power words are not surjective. Power words. Try. For, not for, subjective, for algebraic groups. For algebraic groups, it is so subjective for algebraic groups. It's, it's not subjective in for general. PSL, for PSL2, it is subjective. Yeah, if you take the pth power map, if you're in characteristic P, a unipotent element will not be a pth power. Oh, you mean that the characteristic zero you, we need? Yeah, you, you mean this? Well, even, yeah. So Steinberg had some results on power. Yeah, 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 but there is a finite number of restrictions. 
in Steinberg and uh, yes. for, for for the power for p. So in uh, any other case, we can do the own subjectivity. So maybe yeah, mm -hmm. but it's not the case here. Yeah, mm -hmm. but maybe the question is 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 more difficult for the non-power um, non-power word map. Yeah. Well. I repeat, in, 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 in zero characteristic and in the prime characteristic, there is a standard uh, result which says which kind of characteristic we shall avoid. That's it. Yeah. OK. Any other comments, remarks? OK. Uh, we will convene in about two more minutes, reconvene for, it's my pleasure to introduce Anna Erschler from Paris, who will talk on Poisson, Frestenberg boundary, and Lulaville property of linear finitely generated groups. It's on this, you're here, okay? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak here. So I use my tablet. So maybe when I use my slides, you don't see me, but, but eventually I can switch are. To, so that you can see me. See the, yeah, it's there. Uh, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to speak indeed about living property for, for finally generated linear groups. Um, just I recall some definition that, you, Everybody no, no, knows already. Uh, so um, just uh, the function v, uh, in, maybe I'll try. Do you see also when I write or, or, or do you see when yeah, I write? I saw, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we, we see your marks on the screen. Yes, thank right. you. Yes. So, um, so we, we can consider the growth. The growth is just in, when we have a finally generated group G. We fix some generating set S, and we can see the, the number of elements of N um, of word length at most uh, N. This is a growth function. And um, so today I, I will speak mostly about linear groups. And but first um, I recall something very well known uh, about some um, some properties that are very well known for, for linear groups, right? First of all, this alternative um, um, tells, uh, tells us if you have a finally generated uh, group. Uh, either it's virtually uh, solvable or it has um, a free subgroup. In particular, when it has a free subgroup, this group is non amenable. So, by kids' alternatives, so we know very good uh, which uh, linear groups, um, which finally generated linear groups are amenable or not. Um, so, either, either, either virtually solvable or it is uh, non amenable. And, and um, there is this simple reason to be non amenable. Um, I just recall that in general, for, for some other finally generated groups, uh, some of them don't have free subgroups. It's a, already a bit tricky to construct a finally generated group without, which is non amenable at without free subgroups. But there are, for example, um, bird side groups um, where all elements are, are torsion uh, and some other groups. Um, um, and these are a bit exotic groups. For some groups, like linear groups, there is this uh, simple reason there is a free subgroup inside, uh, then it's non amenable, otherwise, it's amenable. And um, um, I also recall that uh, by, by a result of Milner and Wolf, uh, we, we know that uh, if you have a solvable group, uh, either the growth is polynomial or exponential. Again, if we don't restrict ourselves with uh, linear groups, there are groups of intermediate growth, not polynomial and not exponential. And uh, I will say maybe um, a few words about them, but again, they are more exotic, but for linear groups, either polynomial or, or exponential. Right. And but today, so uh, I'm going to speak about uh, this Liouville Lew property, uh, which, in, in case we consider uh, simple random walks on a group, this is something in between have, uh, having uh, exponential growth and uh, being um, amenable. So uh, we say take a probability measure mu, right? We have this mu. Uh, it doesn't right. Maybe it does. Problem with my stills. So we have this measure mu. So mu is just probability measure. 
мобилити. Mobility measure. Um, and we say that uh, a function is mu harmonic uh, if uh, the mean value of uh, this function is the average uh, or, or of uh, the values in its neighbors. Well, I say neighbors, this, uh, this intuition is especially for finitely generated uh, measures, right? For simple random walks. So, if, uh, so we, we want that in any G in G, right? F of G is the, is the sum F of G H mu of H. Uh, um, and so if, if mu is finitely supported, uh, that means we consider just the Kelly graph of G and the value of the harmonic function is the average of the value in the, in, in the neighbors uh, in the Kelly graph, right? And um, uh, uh, something else I wanted to, to, to remind that so uh, I already mentioned uh, the question of amenability and non-amenability. So there are many equivalent uh, definition of, um, of amenability. Um, so um, for us is a bit relevant uh, the Keston criterion, uh, which says uh, that if you have uh, um, a symmetric measure on G, you look on, on, on the decay of uh, return probability. So we may make N steps of the random walk. Uh, so, um, transition probabilities after n steps correspond to nth convolution of mu. And we, uh, we consider um, we, um, uh, the probability to return to, to, to identity. And uh, Keston criterion tell us uh, if this probability to return to the identity is uh, uh, sub-exponential, then the, gr the group is amenable. Otherwise, it's non-amenable. And um, another well-known criterion is, uh, is uh, Fjolnar criterion about um, Fjolnar sets. Uh, so, and the Fjolnar criterion uh, gives another um, equivalent condition. It tells that the group is amenable if, on, on, if there is a sequence of uh, sets, Vn, such that their boundary is much smaller than uh, the cardinality of these sets. So the boundary, I mean, the discrete uh, notion of boundary, if we consider a Kelly graph, we consider some set, for example, here, the boundary is, uh, are the points of this set that are a distance one from the complement of this set, for example, if I draw this square Z2, then these points are on the boundary of this set V, right? And um, for example, this picture shows on Z2 and on any ZD um, by the same argument, right? So uh, we see the boundary is much smaller than the set. For example, if the growth is, if we have ZD, then we have N to the, approximately N to the D elements in the wall or in, in the cube. And on the boundary we have, we'll have approximately N to D minus one, right? Um, 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 uh, and so th this is a Fulner criterion. And um, there is another equivalent uh, notion uh, in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, uh, Liouville property, which we will mention a little bit later. Yes, so uh, Liouville property is related uh, to triviality of uh, Poisson Furstenberg boundary. So today I will speak mostly about. Uh, uh, cri uh, uh, criteria for triviality or non-triviality of the boundary. And at the end of my talk, um, maybe I, I mention uh, some, some things about the boundary. Mm. And well, not only at the end, but we'll see. Um, but first of all, uh, some general facts. So what do we know about EV property for, for simple random walks? So, um, so if uh, the growth is sub-exponential, then the boundary of simple random walk is trivial. Uh, I don't know why I write in this order. So maybe I start with this. First of all, for, for, for I recall well-known effects for, for abelian groups. So um, if we can see the, so it's well-known on abelian groups, the Poisson boundary is um, always trivial. Um, so the oldest uh, reference I know is in the beginning of the 30s of Capolade for simple random walks on the D. 
And for, for abelian uh, groups, actually, for any probability measure, the boundary is trivial. Uh, this is result due to Blackwell in 55. This result is, is very often mentioned as Shaked Dini theorem. Not only this result, but when we speak about uh, triviality of the bound, Poisson boundary, especially about the case when for all measures on a given group, the boundary is trivial. Many people call it Shaked Dini the uh, theorem. So, um, but actually, Shaked Dini uh, had a result also for locally, um, locally finite abelian groups, but um, uh, this main result for abelian groups is uh, due to Blackwell five years earlier, and somehow he is <laughs> mentioned much less than Shakedanim, but uh, this is the story of the names, right? Uh, and so when we have uh, um, abelian uh, groups, the boundary is always trivial. When we have nilpotent groups, um, uh, also, if we have uh, um, any measure, then uh, the boundary uh, is uh, trivial. Um, yes, as, as something I wanted to mention. So. Uh, um, uh, Please feel free to ask me a question, and actually, it will help me a lot. Uh, I had some technical uh, problems with my internet. I hope now it's, it's fixed, but please tell me if you don't hear me good or if you don't uh, see my slides good, uh, please, please let me know. Um, and if you ask mathematical question, then at least I see that you, you hear me good. So. Um, uh, just um, yes, today we speak about bounded harmonic uh, functions, right? So uh, maybe some of you like more um, um, positive harmonic functions. So I see maybe Gide and uh, Gadia here. So, but uh, here we speak about uh, so. And for nilpotent groups, for example, it's very well known what happens for, 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 for positive harmonic function as well. So this old result of Margulis tells us, well, if the, the, if the measure is symmetric, uh, the boundary is, um, is, um, is trivial. Um, if it's not symmetric, it uh, comes from, 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 a, from a character. So we know how to describe all harmonic functions. But for, for us, mo mostly we want to speak about bounded harmonic functions. And so, um, uh, similar to an important group, a uh, similar argument already in the paper of Azencourt uh, many years ago uh, shows that if you have FC central group, uh, then uh, for, uh, for any measure, uh, measure the boundary is trivial. Maybe I don't recall uh, uh, in detail the notion of FC central um, um, uh, groups and, uh, and as in code didn't use actually this terminology, but basically the result is already there and more explicitly in Lin Zeidenberg and in Yavorsky later, right? Uh, FC, uh, the notion of FC center is um, just a generalization of a center. An element is FC central if it has finitely many conjugates, and so you can consider FC central groups, or you can consider hyper FC central groups take, taking a, a chain of FC central extensions. And then this uh, one of the well known proofs for important groups uh, um, also uh, will work in this context. Uh, but um, only now we'll see it was realized that uh, this is a, an essential uh, observation. But uh, but just wanted to, to recall some examples. So, but if you consider a group of exponential growth, then the uh, the boundary can be trivial. The boundary can be non-trivial. So here, the simplest examples are these very old examples of Kamanovich and Vershek. The, the, uh, they are lamp lighters groups. So lamp lighter uh, is a, a reef product of um, of some group uh, with z to z. z or, so the, the picture is here, right? So uh, we, we take a, a base group, for example, here on the picture is it is Z2, right? And uh, uh, so we, we have a, a configuration of, we have a function from A to, um, to Z to Z. So here on this picture shown uh, as lamps, so these groups are called lamp lighter because one can view them um, with this picture of lamps, right? So at any point of our base group, there is a lamp and there is some, some somebody uh, um, who stays somewhere here in this picture, and um, and the random walk on this group it looks like follows. So this walker can can walk first of all on the base group, so he can walk here, 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 and if he stays at some point, he can switch on or switch off the lamp, right? 
Uh, and um, so we, we get this configuration of lens, uh, apparently supported if you consider um, this, these Reef products, right? And already um, this simple example show that, for example, if you take uh, if you take uh, dimension one, for example, if you take a equal to z, uh, then um, uh, then the, the, the growth is exponential, whatever infinite group A you take, the growth is exponential. But if you take A equal to Z, or if you take A equal to Z2, uh, then the Reef product, uh, Reef product, Reef product will have trivial boundary, trivial boundary, boundary. Uh, and if not, uh, if you take uh, A equal ZD, D at least three, or if you take any group uh, which is not of um, quadratic or linear growth, uh, then the boundary is non-trivial. These are these all the examples of Kamenovich inversion. Here, the boundary is non-trivial. Boundary not trivial. Well, at least for for uh, for um, for simple random walks, and. Uh, actually, uh, for this group, it's also true for any uh, finite entropy or random walk. This is this in, in this generality. This is due to myself uh, many years ago. Um, just to, to 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 remind that we today we speak about group of exp uh, of exponential growth, and here for some groups the boundary is trivial, so some non-trivial. Sometimes we have this trivial property, sometimes not, and something. Else, just for, for um, general information, right? If we consider not only simple random walks but some measures, right? Uh, the boundary is uh, is um, the, the group is amenable if and only if there exist uh, there exists a non-degenerate measure mu, um, uh, uh, which um, with trivial boundary. Mm -hmm. So it was um, an old question at that time of Furstenberg many, many years ago, uh, proven by Kmanovich Versch Rosenblatt. Um, and so for this question, many years ago, we knew the answer how to characterize group which admits some non-degenerate measure with trivial boundary. But surprisingly, uh, 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 a similar question characterized groups which admit something with non-trivial boundary was open until maybe two or three years ago. And um, uh, the, uh, there is this uh, remarkable result of Frisch, Hartmann, Tamuse, and Vahidi Ferdowsi, who, who, who tell us that, uh, so that uh, the group, if on some group G, uh, any, and for any measure, we have UV property, then G must be a hyper FC center, let's say. Oops, I had some problem with slides, but I will fix it in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so so he's, I forgot hyper, hyper center. So as I said, one direction is uh, is well known. So if the group is hyper central, this is uh, uh, due to Adenkot, uh, Yevorsky, um, Lin Zedenberg, and others. So uh, this one you very good. If the group is FC central, then the, 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 we have a UV property, whatever measure we, we take. But um, the, the result of this for all of us shows that it's if and only if. In particular, so if, you, uh, if, if, if this is a result for countable groups, but uh, in particular, if you consider finitely generated groups, so um, uh, the uh, uh, FC central groups are only virtually important groups. So if you have something of not polynomial growth, always we have some, some uh, measure which is not Liouville, but this could be a very, very dispersed measure. And today, I want to sp speak mostly of the most uh, uh, basic uh, class of uh, um, random walks, uh, simple random walks, where the support of the measure is fi uh, finite, and and mm, and some some other random walks. So this is some remark maybe that uh, I'll do later. So so uh, this is just to to remind that sometimes uh, uh, 
even if we have a, a group of intermediate proof, it could be a delicate question to understand what kind of a decay uh, we, uh, we can have for a measure uh, to, to violate uh, the Liouville property. And uh, this is just my, my, my result with uh, Tiani Zhen a few years ago, uh, which uh, showed these nearly optimal measures on Grigor group that are, after all led to uh, near optimal uh, growth estimates of, of these groups. Um, but this is uh, just some side remarks. Uh, if we are not to restrict ourselves with, with uh, finitely supported, sometimes it, it could be a tricky question, and sometimes we can even use uh, harmonic function to understand better growth. But today I want to speak about much more uh, well known and basic examples. Um, maybe I will recall the background a little bit later. First of all, I want to maybe mention one of our results. So what I'm uh, speaking about today, so uh, most of results I'm mentioning today are joined. So the results I'm telling you will be a joint result with uh, Josh Frisch. Josh Frisch. And at the end, I will also mention some result joined with Josh Frisch and also Mark Ragovsky. So, but let me just state one of the results. So, uh, uh, so today I want to discuss, given a linear group over some field, how can we understand that it has real property or not? As I said, as I explained, so you will property for simple groups, something uh, strong, uh, so something in between uh, um, uh, this uh, question of growth, exponential growth, and this question about amenability. And as I mentioned in the beginning, for amenability and for for for, for, for exponential growth, we know very very good um, uh, to which groups, uh, which linear groups uh, have this property, exponential or not exponential growth, amenable or not amenable. And um, there is some reason for that, but but uh, little was known uh, uh, what happens for Levy property for for for. for, for linear groups, some classes were studied, I will mention it in a moment, but in general, um, in gen in general uh, not so much uh, that was known. And I want to formulate our first result with, with Josh. So, we can see this. So, uh, first of all, we want to, to uh, understand whether uh, this linear group has a real property or not. So, uh, since when the group is non amenable, uh, the, we never have a Liouville property for an degenerate measure. So we are only interested in a, in a minimal case that is virtually solvable case. And up to a finite index, our, our group is upper triangular group, right? So we, we, we have a, this group of upper triangular matrices and we do the following. So we have this group and we have considered some i and j so we have this finite matrix and uh, let us associate to this uh, group of matrices um, the following thing consider the following two times two matrices first of all we consider this diagonal matrix with some entries uh, am I, with two entries here uh, so uh, we consider these two times two matrices if in our bigger group, right, the one we are interested in is at this position, I, I, and J, J, we have this uh, entries M, I, I, M, J, J. Uh, and then, um, and we also consider this matrix one, one, zero, one in the following uh, case. We, we look on this position I, J in our group. And suppose that in the, um, in the um, intersection of our group with, with, upper, uh, with only upper triangular matrices, suppose we have at least one non-trivial element of the following form, something at this position we are interested in. Oops. Some other color. So we have, so we look on this uh, given position and um, uh, suppose we have at least one non-zero element here and zero, zero here and something elsewhere, then we consider the, the group generated by such matrices. So we consider uh, uh, a group of two times two matrices and we call this uh, metabilian block associated to our group. 
So these two times two matrices, they're, they're solvable of step two, right? So we have a quotient corresponding to diagonal and something corresponding to, to, to something here. And so uh, we consider this metabelian block. So, um, so our um, result is the following. So uh, take any, any upper triangular um, group of upper triangular matrices and take, uh, take some measure mu and uh, we give a, a necessary and sufficient condition when we will have new property. We say, uh, I wrote here Poisson boundary, actually I've never defined it, but it's the same the, uh, to say the boundary is non-trivial, the same to say this pair is non levial right? So uh, so we say the boundary is non-trivial, that is, uh, J mu is not levial if and only if there exists some Ij such that we have this uh, um, block at this position. So uh, if at some position ij, we don't have anything of this form, we say we don't have uh, a block at ij. So right? this is this group b ij we consider. For some ij, maybe there is nothing, but we look only on this position ij when there is some valid block. And so we say that the, um, the boundary will be trivial if and only if for, uh, for each ij, if you consider some measure on this block, uh, and, and we, we want to, to, to have some measure which, um, which is somehow related to our measure, it's important only to control the, uh, the quotient on this uh, abelian quotient on the diagonal. So we, we consider an associated measure. So if you say associated measure, it means only it has a correct uh, um, quotient on, on, on the abelian um, group. And we say, the, so the boundary is trivial if and only if uh, um, uh, for all blocks, uh, the, uh, the corresponding boundary will be uh, trivial. Right? And moreover, actually, we, we don't only characterize uh, um, the property, but we also describe which elements act um, trivially. So he, he explained um, uh, which elements act uh, tri trivially. Maybe I don't have too much time to um, to go into that. By the way, so uh, uh, how much time do I do I have? So when should I finish the, the talk? Do you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hi, uh, you're, you're supposed to end in about, um, uh, you have 15 minutes, say. 15 minutes, thank you, very good. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, um, so maybe we'll return to that, but I want to also to, um, to, to explain some other results. So um, maybe the main part um, I explained, this one, and then we have a characterization of elements that are trivial and trivial. So this theorem is the first step to understand, given a linear group, whether it's trivial or not. But this is not all. So, uh, so first of all, whatever characteristic of the field, we make this reduction. We make a reduction given by this theorem. And so we, we get a collection of these metabelian blocks. But then even for metabelian gro uh, gr um, group, even of this specific form, uh, as it is written here, and it's not known in general when we have Liouville property and then we don't have. So our next step then to understand, given this uh, metabelian group, to understand whether it has trivial uh, boundary or not. And here we introduce uh, two criteria, one for triviality of the boundary and the other one for non-triviality of the boundary. And, uh, and in particular in characteristic P, um, uh, combining together this theorem and these two criteria will uh, get a complete answer when we do have level property and when we don't. And but and we we have some strategy in a general case. But maybe I mentioned specifically some some examples. So so, so given the metabelian group, for example, of this form, uh, we need to understand: do we have level property or not? And mm, maybe first of all, uh, a corollary. So, um, maybe I, do, uh, I think how to explain it uh, quick enough. So, uh, when we have uh, uh, this metabelian uh, group, so uh, um, 
if if characteristic is p, uh, the metabolian group is p torsion by abelian, right? And if characteristic is zero, we have just a torsion free metabolian group. This is not very important, but it's easier to state some things. So we can restrict ourselves with metabolian groups of this specific form, right? And we, we, we need to understand whether we have Liouville property or not. And uh, given a metabolian group, we consider it is an extension. So we have some extension, right? One, one to B to G. To A to one, right? Where um, where A and B and uh, uh, so now now I speak specifically about the abelian case, right? And uh, so we have a short exact sequence. Uh, so we have this abelian subgroup B. Uh, then we can consider B as um, so and we either B is uh, B is P torsion or torsion free. We can assume it torsion or torsion free torsion free. Then, um, uh, in case of uh, when B is P torsion, we can consider as a vector space over the PZ, right? And if B is torsion free, we can uh, turn the with Q and consider the vector space over Q. And uh, then we can consider so we, um, we can, uh, consider B as a K model. K K. Tablins sometimes a bit tricky. So, um, so we consider uh, uh, this B is uh, uh, K A, let's say, um, um, K A, K A module, right? Module where K is either ZPZ or, or the field uh, K is ZPZ or, um, or it is Q, and uh, we need to, to, to look on, on the rank of this module. So in the following sense, so in this abelian group A, this is just a finally generated abelian group, but we, can, we consider some subgroups ZD, so the group ZD could be much smaller than A, but we need such ZD such that the corresponding module would be finally generated or module as, as KZD module. Then we say that this D is, 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 the, is, is the rank. And we can speak about the rank of metabolian groups in this sense. And so what it turns out, so combining two, two criteria, which I don't have time, I think, to explain in detail. Uh, so we, we see that in, 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 in P torsion by abelian case, uh, it's only the rank that defines uh, what happens with Liouville property. So if rank is at most two, what we show, then we do have Liouville property. And we show if rank is at least three, we don't have Liouville property. So in particular, some, uh, some corollaries of this fact, uh, take some more specific corollary. Uh, take, uh, for example, as the F, uh, I don't know where I denote but F, but I denote it by F. Mm, uh, so if you take some field, um, uh, some field, it's important to look on the tr uh, transcendence de degree of this field, right? And so, if uh, if the transcendence degree is at, at most two, and characteristic of our field, um, so in the characteristic is p, then we show with Josh that the uh, the boundary is trivial. And uh, in general, if uh, we take uh, a field of whatever characteristic, that is, if we take a field of of characteristic zero, if transcendence degree is one, is at most one. Then we also have Liouville property, and in characteristic zero case, this can cannot be improved to, to do. But first, to, to mention that some classes of groups that were studied before, if you take, for example, polycyclic groups, here the triviality of the Poisson boundaries due to a relatively old result of Vadim Kamenovich, and polycyclic groups, as you know, are precisely groups which are which are linear over Z, right? Or, for example, if you take uh, the field of rationals, right, a result of uh, Brafieri and Shapira shows also that uh, the boundary is trivial for, for, for symmetric random box in this case. Both result of Shapira, uh, Brafieri, and Kemanovich, they do not only they give the um, triviality of the boundary, they, they show also more, they, they describe the boundary in case it's not trivial, but an important observation that it's trivial. So if you consider simple random box, then the boundary is trivial for polycyclic race, for, 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 for fields over Q. 
also uh, actually in the case of Q, so uh, linear groups over Q are basically uh, torsion-free uh, finite proof rank groups. And for, 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 for finite proof rank groups, um, not only torsion-free, uh, the result of Kronolietes Serra later shows a finer property more stronger than the uh, triviality of the boundary about Fölner couples. But anyway, in all these groups, we know uh, we knew already the triviality of the boundary. But if you compare with our corollary, these are very specific groups. You see here, the transcendence degree is, is zero, right? And so, so our corollary so seems to be new even in, in transcendence degree one, right? And uh, as I said, for, for characteristic P, it's true for, for, for transcendence degree two. And so, um, and um, another corollary of what I, what I said. Uh, so, uh, so if you take, take take for the moment also characteristic P case, I will comment on, on zero characteristic in a moment. But uh, take characteristic P case, then the uh, the polling properties are equivalent. So we, we we take a linear group of upper triangular matrices, and we want to know whether it's Liouville or not. And so the polling are equivalent. Uh, uh, First property is that there exists a basic block, this BIJ, this basic metabolian block, which contains a reef product as a subgroup, right? just usual three-dimensional reef products as a subgroup. Uh, or, 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 or this is equivalent to say that there exists a simple random block on our group G, on our linear group G, with non-trivial Poisson boundary. And in this case, all the reducible random walks on G of finite entropy have non-trivial boundary. This turns out to be equivalent. So uh, just a remark. So uh, when for general groups, it's not known, even for this uh, very particular example of a subgroup of, of a three-dimensional reef, uh, reef product, one does not know when some group contains a given group, and this smaller group has no trivial boundary, is not Liouville. We don't know in general whether a simple random walk on a larger group will, 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 uh, um, will be non-Liouville. So, 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 so uh, the claim is, is corollary is not uh, a priori non-trivial in both direction. Just to uh, um, another remark that uh, by our results, right? So uh, triviality or non-triviality of the boundary reduces to the cases that the block contains as a subgroup a reef product. Our group, however, doesn't contain, it doesn't need to contain uh, in this case as a subgroup or as a core, as a section these with, with reef product. So just uh, again, with some analogy with the question of growth and non-mobility, for example, so. It's important to know that when we have a solvable group, right? So, uh, if uh, uh, so, the exponential growth is equivalent to existence of a free uh, semi group, right? But at least in one direction, it's true in general for, for any group. So, it's, uh, it's straightforward. If you have a free semi group, then uh, the growth is exponential. Or uh, coming back to, to this alternative, uh, again, for any group, if we have a free subgroup, obviously the group is non amenable. Here, uh, when we speak about level property, uh, both directions are not so clear. But again, so um, some analogy that the question of triviality and triviality on our linear group, we reduce. To, to, to some question that the blocks contain some, some standard object. In our case, this three-dimensional product as a subgroup, right? So maybe, um, let's see a few words. So uh, ju just to explain that uh, in characteristic zero, uh, uh, the things are a bit more tricky. So the rank doesn't define whether we have UV property or not. And um, just as, as, as some examples here, if we consider, for example, matrices like this, and I think I forgot to, to say something else, MX, I forgot to draw some matrices, which I'll draw in a moment. If you can see the matrices like this, 1x, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, y, right? Uh, then uh, um, uh, consider a group generated by such matrices. So, uh, so it's easy to see if alpha is not algebraic, the rank is free. But if alpha is algebraic, it's easy to see the, the rank is two. But uh, um, then if alpha is a root of unity, it's not an interesting case because then G, G alpha has a, a finite index subgroup uh, uh, group, which is a quotient of two dimensional light, light like this. So the boundary here is trivial. 
But if alpha is not uh, the root of unity um, about algebraic, right? Uh, then we, we, we have a group of rank two, but such that any finite entropy non degenerate random work on alpha has non trivial boundary. <laughs> so in characteristic zero, so, so, so the rank doesn't give a, a, an answer, but we have a conjecture um, when the, 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 the group of characteristic zero should, should be Louisville. Maybe I don't have time to explain in detail, but, but I wanted to mention at least some examples. So oh, take the groups like this. So the groups uh, generated by the following matrices. So we have this matrix delta one 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 zero one, and then we have just some uh, independent variables. Let's say d independent variables x one, x d, and we consider um, uh, the, the group uh, um, the group uh, um, the, the field of rational functions so in in x one uh, x d. Uh, which have uh, as denominators only negative, poss possibly some powers of xi and xi plus one, right? Uh, so, uh, so I, we call this group bounds like groups. So uh, this is the simplest example of a well-known bounds like construction. So uh, an old result of bounds like right uh, tells us if we have a metabelian group, it can be embedded in a finitely presented metabelian group. So uh, this group, uh, this group which we call Bumslag groups, uh, is just a particular example of Bumslag's construction. When we start with Reef product, because if we, if we don't, I don't know how to say, if we don't consider these groups, uh, we, these matrices, right? If we consider only these kind of generators, we clearly uh, get a Reef product. And if we consider, uh, depending on what field we consider, if we consider over the Z to Z, we, we, we get a Reef product of the D with Z to Z. If we, <laughs> consider here integer coefficients, right? Yeah, so we, uh, then we, we, we get uh, the ZD with Z, or ZD with Z to Z. And uh, so the, these bumps are groups uh, is example of how, how to embed a reef product in a finite uh, presented group. So, he, so he, if we get the, the, the D at least three, uh, so many years ago, I had this example, and these were first finally presented examples with non-trivial, uh, with non-trivial um, boundary, right? But so here it was known already if d at least three, the boundary is non-trivial. But the most tricky case is here uh, when d is equal to two. So just to mention, so for these metabelian groups up to now, so they're very simply looking right metabelian groups. So uh, uh, until now it wasn't known, and now we do know when we have Liouville property. First of all, just a particular case of, uh, of this corollary I explained you already uh, in characteristic P case. So uh, a particular case here, if we, if we consider B is this bounds like group of, uh, over the ZPZ with, X, with two variables, X1, X2. So, um, so with Josh, we show here the boundary is trivial for simple random walks, actually for any second moment uh, random walks. But, um, then, then if we consider characteristic zero case, when we consider integer coefficients, our result with Josh Frisch and um, with Mark Richnovsky, uh, Rich, uh, um, uh, Richnovsky shows that here the boundary, I forgot to write the boundary, we have the uh, G -G -Mu is not here. Really. Maybe I don't have the time to explain in detail. So these bounds like groups, not only in questions of, 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 of the boundary, uh, um, have some strong asymptotic analogy with reef products. So it's, uh, um, uh, it's not surprising, but, uh, but uh, was not so straightforward to show that uh, in that uh, in, uh, in D2 case, uh, so, so there is analogy, right? We have this BD for ZPZ. This is analogous, analogous to Z2, uh, the reef product Z2 with ZPZ. Uh, and here, so it is analogous, but uh, the, the proof is, uh, is more tricky. But now with, uh, with Josh Pidusho, here the boundary is trivial. But this analogy breaks for some other asymptotic property. Actually, there the exists an analogy between BD, so D equal to 2, right? P2, let's say P2, P2 uh, of Z is somehow analogous to Z2 with Z. 
for, for some other properties, yes, but for um, for um, for the question of the of triviality of the boundary here, this energy breaks because here the boundary is trivial. So we know very good, but here we prove it non-trivial, right? So I guess I need to uh, to finish. So maybe just say quickly. So uh, uh, the conjecture that, that we have that uh, the boundary in general case will be for linear group will be trivial uh, if and only if uh, for simpler random work let's say if and only if when we look on these blocks then these blocks can have uh, the rank one two three and so on right we know already from uh, our result shows already if the rank is at least three the boundary is non trivial this we know in in a whatever characteristic of the field is so uh, so the question is only about uh, groups of rank uh, two and uh, rank two if all all blocks of rank one also something we show with josh and the boundary is trivial so the question only when about blocks of rank really exactly two and so uh, and uh, so our conjecture that the boundary will be trivial only if and only if all uh, blocks of rank two are, are, are um, uh, essentially two-dimensional uh, Reef products. So uh, uh, passing to a finite index subgroup, we can assume that really they, they are um, virtually uh, Reef product of Z2 with Z. Otherwise, we conjecture that the boundary is non-trivial. So this, this as a, uh, example um, we, with, uh, together with Mark is, yeah. is just um, confirm, just one, uh, one example um, in favor of this conjecture. And I guess I have to stop. So maybe I turn um, off. I can turn off. There, uh, at the end, do you, uh, you have a, we're about to begin the next talk in about four minutes. Okay. Do you have any, uh, do you have another three or four minutes uh, to want to present? I haven't uh, understood. So uh, there are a few four minutes for me or, or for questions for me or? I mean, you're. <clears throat> you've gone over about seven minutes now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's just we'll contract questions then. Uh, are there any questions? Maybe. There are any questions? Anybody have questions? Okay. If not, thank you for your uh, interesting talk. And in about three minutes, we will begin uh, again with Professor Paramala. Okay? Okay. Our next speaker is Professor Paramala, who will talk on Pencils of quadratic period index questions pip, uh, for hyperelliptic curves. There we are. Uh, hello, thank you very much. And um, so first, um, I feel extremely honored to be invited to speak in this very special Amitso Symposium to celebrate his uh, 100th birth anniversary. Thanks to the organizers. Okay, so let me uh, begin with, uh, uh, I just want to say that all that I'm going to say is a piece of joint work with Jaya Iyer and with uh, some contributions uh, from Ramanan uh, for certain rational constructions concerning hyperelliptic curves. So doesn't go forward. It doesn't. Uh, no, it doesn't go forward. No, it doesn't. Click there. Okay. On the screen, and Yeah. Okay. Now I'm good. Yeah. So, um, so let me begin with. Uh, 
a pencil of quadrics, Q1 and Q2 are uh, two uh, symmetric matrices uh, in size 2G plus 2. And Q is the pencil given by TQ1 minus Q2. Uh, it's a pencil of uh, quadrics in P2G plus 1. And FT is the discriminant of this pencil, which is negative 1 power G plus 1 times the determinant of TQ1 minus Q2, which is a polynomial in CT. And we assume throughout that uh, this uh, FT has no multiple zero. We call such a pencil, a uh, non-singular pencil. And um, the, if you look at the corresponding quadrix Q1 and Q2 in P2G plus 2, the intersection X of these two quadrix is called the base locus of the pencil. Under our assumption, this base locus is a smooth projective variety. Now C is the smooth hyperelliptic curve defined by the equation, a fine equation y squared equal to ft. And the genus of this curve is G. That is this 2G plus 2 is anticipatory. The curve defined by this equation is of genus G. Okay, so we begin with the question of Andre Weil, who asked whether one can relate the complex geometry of the hyperelliptic curve C to the internal geometry of the base locus X of the pencil Q. So already in 1954, uh, there is a paper of Luc Gauthier and the title of the paper is Footnote, uh, footnote of Andre Weil where he gives a positive answer to Weil's question. So if you just take alpha, any complex number, and Q alpha is the member of the pencil corresponding to this alpha, T equal to alpha, which is alpha Q1 minus Q2. So let's assume that Q alpha is non-singular. It is not one of the uh, singular fibers. If it is non-singular, then uh, So the Lagrangian of maximal uh, dimensional isotropic subspaces in this, uh, in this fiber Q alpha has two components, C alpha one and C alpha two. Now the pairs Q alpha together with one of the pick components C alpha J, alpha and C, J equal to one, two, give a two sheeted covering of P1 defining the hyperelliptic curve C. And further, the Grassmannian of G-dimensional linear subspaces contained in the base locus. That is, these G-dimensional linear subspaces which are contained on in every, every, every member of the pencil. This Grassmannian is indeed the Jacobian of the curve C. This is, uh, this is in Lacautier's paper. The above connections are taken a step further by Narasimhan and Ramanan for the case genus is two, and later by Deshali Ramanan for arbitrary genus. <clears throat> so what they prove is the following. Suppose L0 is a line bundle of odd degree over C, and NC to L0 is the moduli space of stable rank two vector bundles on C with determinant L0. I G minus one Q, this denotes the Grassmannian of G minus one dimensional linear subspaces contained in the base locus X. Then they prove that the moduli space MC to L naught is isomorphic to this uh, Grassmannian I G minus one Q. Okay, this is a step further than the previous identification of the Jacobian of the curve with the G dimensional Grassmannian in the base locus. Okay, so this is the, all this is written down uh, originally or complex numbers. And um, Ramanan has made the above constructions rational or any field of characteristic node two. So let me explain. So here we don't start with the pencil. You start with the hyperelliptic curve, K is any field and characteristic of K is node two. And C over K is a smooth projective hyperelliptic uh, curve of genus G which has a rational point. This is a standing assumption throughout. And P is a pick a rational point, point P in CK. So let eta from C to P1 
be the double cover given by the equation y squared equal to ft and degree of f is 2g plus 2. And w is the ramification divisor of eta, this is the divisor on c, and degree of the divisor w is 2g plus 2. L0 denotes the line bundle of degree 2g minus 1 given by o, uh, the, uh, this line bundle OC of 2g minus 1p for this pick of the point p. We fix this line bundle. Then V denotes the vector space of sections of this line bundle L0 restricted to this zero dimensional scheme W, the ramification divisor. This H0 is a vector space of dimension 2g plus 2. So all our pencils are going to live on this vector space V of dimension 2g plus 2. <clears throat> then uh, Ramanan constructs a pencil of quadrics. Q, let me call it Q0, which is TQ1 minus Q2 on the vector space V, which we just defined with the discriminant of the pencil equal to FT and isomorphisms of the moduli space MC to L0 with the Grassmannian of G minus one dimensional uh, uh, linear subspaces contained in the base locus of Q0. And also, also he gives an isomorphism uh, psi naught from the degree G, uh, Jacobian of degree G devices, it divisor classes, JG of C with IG of Q0, the G dimensional linear subspaces in the base locus. We should note that in the earlier case, uh, over an algebraically closed field, we had an identification of the Jacobian with IG, but rationally, uh, this is the JG, which admits uh, an isomorphism to IG of Q0. So these, these are explicitly written down by Ramanian over any field of characteristic different from two. So as the immediate corollary you get, you have constructed a pencil Q0, this is Ramanian's pencil, and it has the property because C is a curve which we assume has a rational point. This JG of C definitely has a rational point, and therefore the right-hand side IG of Q0 has a rational point. That means that the base locus of Q0 the pencil has a G-dimensional linear zero space, okay? So this is something special. Such a pencil, that is a pencil which we define, non-singular pencil, if it has a G-dimensional zero space in the base locus, we call this pencil a soluble pencil, okay? So the, the pencil constructed by Ramanan is indeed a soluble pencil. And uh, and, and uh, now we have this, uh, these isomorphisms. We would like to define an action of the two torsion of the pick, Picard group of C uh, on the moduli space NC to L0, as well as the G, G minus one, the right hand side IG minus one of Q0. We would like to define an action which, which this isomorphism C respects, okay? So how is the action defined? On the moduli space NC2 L0, this is rank two bundles with fixed determinant. There's an obvious action by tensoring. Take a two torsion line bundle L, uh, then send a vector bundle E to L tensor E. This gives an action of the two torsion of the pick on the moduli space MC2 L0. Now we define an action of two pick C on the uh, on IG minus one Q0. It is induced by a linear action on the ambient project project is space PV. So let me define some, um, some terminologies. So the R odd plus Q naught is as the matrices alpha in SLV, which is a projective similarity for both Q1 and Q2 with the same similarity factor lambda. That is alpha Q1 alpha transpose is lambda Q1, alpha Q2 alpha transpose is lambda Q2, together with lambda power G plus one equal to one. These are so-called uh, uh, proper similitudes. And uh, go modulo the center, which is mu 2g plus two. So this is the scheme odd plus q naught. And this is a subgroup uh, subgroup of PSOQ1 as well as PSOQ2. And uh, this sits inside PGL 2g plus two, which is PGL of the ambient vector space B. Now, the lemma, uh, first lemma is that this odd plus Q naught, it is over KS. This is this group Z mod to Z power 2G. It's a finite group, uh, 2G copies of Z mod 2Z. 
this is um, uh, one can uh, this is again classical this can be traced back to uh, uh, the thesis of miles reed so if ft is the the ft is the polynomial which defines the hyperelliptic curve ft is factor is this over the separable closure as product of linear factors t minus lambda j so over the separable closure ks both q1 and q2 can be simultaneously diagonalized by a choice of basis as follows suppose v1 v2 v2 g plus 2 are vectors chosen such that vi is a non zero vector in the radical of the singular fiber lambda i q1 minus q2 you remember t q1 minus q2 the discriminant is precisely ft and this lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 2 g plus 2 are simply the zeros of ft where the pencil is degenerate and you take the degenerate fibers and choose uh, vectors in the radical of this uh, of these uh, forms and call this uh, v1 v2 v2 g plus 2 this in fact is a basis of v and one as you clearly see that both q1 and q2 become diagonal with respect to this base they are both diagonal at the same time with respect to this basis further over the separable closure we can uh, scale these vi's as we like so we can assume that q1 is the identity matrix and q2 is the diagonal matrix lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 2 g plus 2 okay so now you can directly compute what is this odd plus you can always choose a representative of odd plus as a matrix in sl2 g plus 2 or the separable closure, which satisfies the identities TQ1, T transposes Q1, and TQ2, T transpose is Q2. And uh, you can directly calculate in this case, T reduces simply to the diagonal matrix with all the diagonal entries plus or minus one, which means if it is in SL2G plus two, the product of diagonal entries is one, and you have to go modulo the scalars plus one minus one. So you get this, um, uh, you, you get this um, this uh, isomorphism odd plus q naught k is with z mod to z power two g plus two. So it's a finite group. Okay, and uh, so we want to uh, define an isomorphism of two pick c or k s with this odd plus q naught over k s. We want to identify these two group spins. So the two pick c it is generated over the separable closure. We know the two the hyperelliptic curve is given, and p1, p2, p2g plus two in CKS are the ramification locus for the covering C to p1. Then the two torsion is precisely generated by such divisor classes p2g plus two minus pi. I varies from one to two g plus one with a single relation. The sum of all this is equal to zero in two pick. These form a set of generators with one relation. So to define a map, we can define it on generators as uh, P2G plus two minus PI mapping to a diagonal matrix epsilon F1, epsilon two, epsilon two G plus two, where the, all the epsilon Js are one, except at the ith place and two G plus two -th place where the epsilon i's are negative one, okay? So this you can check extends to a isomorphism of these two groups. And you, this actually is, uh, uh, descends to a rational isomorphism of two pick C with odd plus Q naught. Okay, so we have this isomorphism psi of the modulus phase with uh, IG minus one Q naught. And uh, you have a cos, suppose we start with a cocycle beta. And this isomorphism, of course, respects the action of two pick C. This can be verified. So suppose we start with the cocycle beta from the Galois group, absolute Galois group of K gamma K to the two torsion of the pixie KS points. Then you can uh, twist both sides, MC to L naught, as well as IG minus one Q naught. Uh, both sides can be twisted through this cocycle beta. And uh, therefore, and uh, let us denote the twist of Q naught by, okay, how do you twist uh, Q naught by beta? Uh, so you have this two pick C acting uh, acting on uh, um, acting on the projective space, and therefore it is acts on the IG minus one Q naught. So and two pick 
through the isomorphism topic with automorphisms of Q0. So that gives the cocycle with values in odd plus Q0. So the right hand side can be twisted through this cocycle. Okay, so the net effect we have an isomorphism C beta of the twisted moduli space MC beta to L0 with IG minus one of Q0 beta, the twist of the pencil. Well, so, so let me explain what is the interest in uh, the study of this twisted moduli space and what is the interest in comparing it with the right hand side, which is a sort of a twisted pencil. Okay, let me digress a bit. Uh, okay, before, before that, let me just say one thing. So we have an identification of the moduli space with IG minus one of this twisted pencil. I should just say a word about what this twisted pencil means. What does it give, what object? So, so if, you, if you take this composite two pixel seat odd plus, which sits inside PSOQ1, which sits inside PGL2G two plus, two plus two. So this cocycle with odd plus Q0 gives a cocycle in PSOQ1, as well as a cocycle in PGL2G plus two. The cocycle at the end gives a central simple algebra of degree 2G plus two over the base field, call this A beta, corresponding to the uh, cocycle to the very end. And the cocycle with values in P, S, O, Q, 1 gives a descent uh, uh, A beta tau 1 of an algebra with an orthogonal involution, okay? Now, A beta is a central, so the, the sort of twisted pencil lives on this um, uh, non-split algebra, possibly non-split algebra A beta over the base field. And uh, so the question is, when is this pencil uh, okay, so maybe to describe the pencil completely, so you have this uh, A beta tau one corresponding to a descent of Q1 and Q2 makes a symmetric, brings about a symmetric unit U in the algebra A beta star, beta star, which is symmetric with respect to the involution tau one. Now you take T minus U, this sort of pencil Hermitian forms on A beta tau one tensor KT, this in fact defines the pencil Q0 beta. For each T, you have a symmetric unit and you have a corresponding involution. So, and IG minus one, once again, is the Grassmannian of G minus one times two G plus two dimensional, totally isotropic ideals in the algebra A beta, A beta is missing there, A beta, for both the involutions tau one and in two composite tau one. And the question is, when is this twisted pencil Q0 beta a genuine pencil of quadrics? In fact, from the way it is defined, it's clear. It's a genuine pencil of quadrics, even only if the associated uh, algebra A beta, which comes in, is the split algebra. Then you can identify it with the uh, actual pencil. <clears throat> now, let me come to the interest in the study of the twisted model space MC beta to L0. So the uh, so we are interested in sort of period index, index questions for the Brouwer group of the curve C for a smooth projective curve C or a totally imaginary number field K. Okay, in this situation, so the question, uh, uh, period index question is the following. That does there exist a D such that for every element in the two torsion of the Brouwer group of the function field, the index is, uh, divides two to the power D. You can uniformly bound the indices of all the elements in the two torch of the Brouwer group of the function field. Of course, you can also raise this question for any prime P, or you can just raise the question for the entire Brouwer group. The interest in the two torsion of the Brouwer group comes from um, uh, certain interesting questions from quadratic forms. So, So let me remind us uh, the U invariant of a field F, F is characteristic different from two, is the maximum dimension of anisotropic quadratic forms over the field F. Okay, so if K is, uh, for instance, if you have a, a finite field, it is uh, two and periodic field, the U invariant is four. So also for a totally imaginary number field, every five dimensional quadratic form is isotropic. So U invariant of a totally imaginary number field is four. 
Now, if you go to function field of a core K, so the question is whether this has bounded U invariant, okay? So the, the answer, I mean, the answer to this question of boundedness of the U invariant is contained in the question whether the two torsion of the Brouwer group of the function field has bounded index. Let me repeat, if the two torsion of the Brouwer group of KC has bounded index, then the U invariant of the function field KC is finite. So this is a big open question. That is the interest in bounding indices in the two torsion. Of course, intrinsically, it's also interesting to have bounds for other primes P. And in fact, this U invariant question, even for if you take Q root minus one, the totally imaginary number field, and you take the rational function field in one variable over this field, it is not clear whether forms of large enough rank have a non-trivial zero, whether the U invariant is finite is a big open question. Okay, we have some reductions of these questions to the so-called uh, unramified case within quotes. So let me explain. Suppose K is a number field, O is the ring of integers in K, and C over K is a smooth projective curve over K, for the moment, any general projective curve. And let's take a regular proper model script C of C over K. Then the Brouwer group of the model two torsion sits inside the Brouwer group of the curve C, which is still a subgroup of the two torsion of the Brouwer group of the function field. Okay, so we have the following result, which is due to Lieblich suration myself, that if for, for all curves C, if the two torsion of the Brouwer group of a model has bounded index, then for all curves C, the two torsion of the Brouwer group of the function field has bounded index. Okay, so the question of bounding the indices is reduced to bounding indices for the unramified uh, Brouwer group. Of course, noting that it's not enough to do it for just C. So the idea of uh, how one gets this statement is that starting with the Brouwer class in the function field over the given KC, you go to, uh, I think in this case, a degree eight extension of the function field, where you can show that the Brouwer class you started with is unramified on a corresponding model for that finite extension. And so if that is bounded, then the original index will be bounded by eight times the index you get there. Okay, so the whole question is reduced to bounding indices of unramified classes. Okay, now there is this Leibniz uh, program to uh, relate uh, indices of our classes. We are studying the twisted modelized spaces. So which I'll explain now, suppose alpha tilde, we are interested in the Brouwer group, unramified Brouwer group, start with one, and it gives the element in H2 CGM, which uh, gives an element of the two torsion of the Brouwer group of the function field unramified on C. The first fact to note is that if you take something like uh, on, the, on the model, if you take a finite place and the completion at the finite place, this Brouwer class vanishes. That is because it depends the Brouwer class or the model or OV, which is a relative curve over this complete discrete value ring with residue field of finite field. So this goes back to Grothendieck that this Brouwer group is zero. So at all finite places, this Brouwer class vanishes. Now, suppose you take alpha, we have something in the Brouwer group H2CGM, choose a lift alpha in H2C mu2, which represents alpha tilde in the Brouwer group. We can choose a lift because this map is on to from H2C mu2 to H2C on to the two torsion of the Brouwer group. Okay, suppose since the C of K is not empty, we can even pick a lift such that this lift vanishes over K bar or the algebraic closure because the discrepancies are measured by pick C mod two. So this is possible. So this alpha in H2C mu2 defines a mu2 gerb on C. And let's denote by MC alpha to L0. This is uh, Leibniz notation. This is the model S space of alpha twisted rank two stable locally free sheaves of determinant L0. Okay, so this is the twisted sheaves in the model S space. So how is it related to the spaces we were looking at? Okay, this H2 here by Larry, we have H2C mu2 has a decomposition, H2K mu2, direct sum H2, H1K, two pick C, direct sum a Z mode two factor. And you take the projection of alpha to H1K two pick, call the class beta in H1K two pick C. 
and lift this class to a upocycle beta from gamma k to two pick c k bar. So you do get from alpha a job, a cosine one cosine with values in two pick c, and so you have we have already we have already defined the m c beta two l naught which we discussed before. You take the modulus space of rank two bundles with determinant l naught. And twist it through the cosecle beta, which has values in two pick C, which operates on the moduli space. Okay. The right hand side, we have seen the twist. The left hand side is the twist for the gerbs, and these two can be identified. This is due to Liebig. So, this twisted moduli space with respect to the gerb is the same as the twist of the rank moduli space MC2L naught by the cosecle beta. Okay. And the second fact is that if you have any alpha tilde and two Brava C, the unramified Brava group, let us assume if it is totally imaginary, we don't need this condition. If it, if it is as real places, let's assume it is locally trivial. Okay, And let L not be a land bundle of odd degree. This is important. And uh, al then this alpha, the lift we have chosen is zero over the algebraic closure. Then this, uh, then it is, a, it is a fact that MC alpha, to L0, the twisted modulus space has a K point implies that the index of alpha tilde divide, divides two. We have come to the index questions. Whenever the more twisted modulus space has a rational point, then the index divides two, that is index, index, index and period coincide for such classes. This is exactly what we wanted, a bound for the index, okay? At least in this case, if you fix a hyperelliptic curve, do all this process, if the modulus space, we are looking for a point for the modulus space that would give the period equal to index. Okay, this is the connection. But we need a, we need a, a rational point on the modulus space. How is it? Uh, what, how does it give the period equal to index? It uses the following facts, namely the modulus space is a, a smooth projective geometrically integral rational variety whose pick is z and the Brouwer group is Brouwer group of the base field. This is just all Brouwer classes on this modulus space are constant Brouwer classes. And the modulus stack to modulus space is a mu to gerb associated to constant Brouwer class theta because the whole Brouwer group is uh, constant. So we have a constant Brouwer class. And this gerb actually locally untwist because alpha, the Brouwer class alpha tilde kv by our assumption locally is zero which means that all these stacks and spaces, they all untwist. And so the model is stack locally has a point. And therefore the class theta is zero locally. Theta is a Brouwer class in K constant Brouwer class, which is locally zero. And by Hasse Brouwer Neuter, uh, we have that this Brouwer class theta itself is zero. And therefore the, since the job, job is zero, since the job is zero, there is a rank, uh, the, since the, uh, there is a rank two locally free alpha twisted sheaf E, there is a, there is a K rational point of the modal stack and you take the endomorphisms of this twisted sheaf, you get a degree two as my algebra and that represents your Brouwer class alpha tilde. So the index is bounded by two. This is the whole connections between uh, period index bounds and the modal space. The point is we need rational points for the modulus space in order to conclude. If there is a rational point for the modulus space, you conclude index divides two. So this is a chain of arguments why we are interested in the, in the twisted modulus spaces. The first example is that if you take a smooth projective curve of genus two, so I'm just cleaning down to an example when the genus is two and the curve has a rational point and alpha tilde is a Brouwer class, which is locally trivial. And uh, uh, alpha, is, uh, alpha is a pick of alpha tilde, which, is va which vanishes over k bar. Then, in fact, you can show that the, this modulus space, twisted modulus space, has a k rational point. And hence, you have that index is equal to one or two, period equal to index in this case. There is a solid example where the, what we expect is true, namely the case of genus two curves. So how does the proof go? It, uh, it uses the following twisted Hecke correspondence, the untwisted Hecke correspondence be between modulus space of even and odd determinant uh, 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 
uh, rank two bundles uh, is uh, given by Narasimhan and Ramani, the so-called Heke correspondence. And the whole thing can be twisted by this uh, co-cycle alpha to get a twisted diagram. So in this twisted diagram, see all that we are interested in is in a rational point for MC alpha to OCP or, or determinant case, we want a rational point here. So we have this AK correspondence. And on the top, we have semi-stable bundles of rank two and trivial determinant. And this, when you untwist over the algebraic closure, this is simply a P3. So this is a very nice case. MCSS semi-stable of two OC is the projective variety P3, projective space. And therefore, this is a twist of the projective space. So this is a severe Brouwer variety of dimension three. And this, uh, when you look at this diagram, the whole diagram untwists locally. And uh, untwist locally means you get the usual Poincare correspondence between odd and even degree uh, determinant bundles. And therefore the right-hand side, the MCSS2OC, this variety is actually, this is, this is what I've explained. The top corner is a P3 locally. So you have a severe Brouwer variety is locally a, a P3 it has points. So it is globally a P3. And so it has plenty of points. So in the stable locus, there is a rational point for this MCSS alpha 2 OC. And then, so let me go back to this, uh, this Hecke diagram. So S prime, if you take a stable point on the right-hand side, the fiber uh, geometrically is a P1 that you can check over a stable point. And therefore, rationally, the fiber is a conic. And the conic locally has a point because the whole thing unfits. And therefore, it has a global point. So the fiber has a point. That means there's a rational point in the twisted P alpha, which projects down to a rational point of the twisted modular space. So this is the Hecke diagram, which gives a rational point for the twisted modular space in the case where the genus is two, thereby yielding also the period is equal to index. Now, let us, uh, let us feed back this information to pencils. What do we have here? So you know, suppose uh, we uh, set back the uh, previous notation, K is a totally imaginary number field. C over K hyper elliptic curve, alpha in H2 C mu 2. The Brouwer class alpha tilde is locally zero. And beta is the projection of alpha to co-cycle gamma K to two pick C. And then you have this twisted modular space MC beta, which is the same as MC alpha, which we explained. And MC beta is in fact isomorphic to IG minus one of Q naught beta, this twisted pencil and the G minus one dimensional Lagrangian. So if you want to relate it to classical objects uh, in terms of quadrics and uh, zero spaces, we would prefer to have Q naught beta a genuine pencil instead of a twisted pencil. And this is indeed true if you have this assumption that this alpha, alpha tilde, the Brouwer class is locally essentially trivial. That is the next remark. So if uh, alpha tilde, the Brouwer class is locally trivial, this pencil actually untwists, it's a genuine pencil of cortex. This is not obvious. I mean, there is a, there is a result of Arul Shankar and Bank, who also discussed pencils of quadrix in a different context. They prove that this composite pick C mod 2 to H2 C mu 2, you compose it all the way to H1 K P G L 2 G plus 2. So this composite is zero is what they prove, provided uh, the, you know, the pencil you have is a soluble pencil. And we did remark that the Ramanan pencil Q0 is a soluble pencil. So this composite is zero for Q0. And uh, therefore, so your alpha tilde, the Brouwer class locally zero means the class of alpha in H2 C mu 2 comes from pick C mod 2 um, locally. So the Brouwer class locally vanishes and back you get the Brouwer class is globally zero. And consequence is that this pencil is untwisted. So if you take a locally trivial Brouwer class, you get a genuine pencil of quadrix. And uh, so, so we have this isomorphism of this twisted modular space and the G minus one dimensional zero subspaces of the base locus of the pencil of, there's no twisted pencil, it's a genuine pencil of cortex. If you can prove there's a rational point on either side, either side you have a lot of information, okay? We are looking for rational points. 
And both the sides have plenty of rational points locally because the twist and twist and modulus spaces always have rational points. So right hand side has rational points. So locally they have rational points and uh, we are looking for a global rational point for either side. But let us get back to genus two where we know that the twisted modulus space left hand side we have proved has a rational point. The example where genus is two, can we feed it back to the right hand side and say something about pencils of quadrics uh, intersections and a Hasse principle. That's what I do next. So first of all, Q naught beta is a soluble pencil. So it has a, a G dimensional linear subspace in the base locus. Now, if you put G is equal to two, so what are the spaces which come into play? The right hand side, I G minus one becomes I one. That is uh, that is simply the base locus of the pencil Q naught beta in this case. So getting to this isomorphism, so what we get since we have proved already in this case, the modulus space, the twisted modulus space has a rational point. You conclude the following about the corresponding pencil, namely if X is a smooth intersection of two quadrics in P5. Suppose X contains a line locally for all B in B. This is the condition you get by saying that the pencil is soluble locally. This is what we, this is slightly stronger than X has a local point. It has a line locally. Then in fact, the, the base locus has a rational point. So this is the conclusion. It's a sort of as a principle, except that the local condition is much stronger, that it contains a line locally. So in fact, um, Hasse principle for smooth intersection of two quadrics in P5 is a very open question. One does not know whether this holds. Okay, so this is the best we get from, from our discussion. So I would like to stop here. Thank you all. Thank you. Our uh, next talk, uh, uh, will be in uh, 10 minutes. Um, and it will be Professor Garalnik. Um, but till then, can we, are there any questions? Anybody have questions, comments? Otherwise, we adjourn. For I have a question. <clears throat> okay. If the Hasse principle doesn't hold um, on that last slide, uh, uh, what it, kind of obstruction would you expect to find? Oh. Uh, okay. So um, I have no answer, but uh, apparently, I mean. This is the theorem of Wittenberg, I think, that under certain Chinzel's hypothesis, you expect Hasse principle to hold for the smooth intersection of two quadrics in P5. For higher dimensional case, uh, the higher genus, more or less genus is large enough, there is always a rational point in the intersection of the two quadrics. But what we are interested in is a higher dimensional linear space of zeros in the base, base uh, in the base locus. G minus one dimensional zeros is the problem, but uh, which is different from the case when it is genus one, where it's just the rational points. And uh, we expect that there is Hasse principle possibly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I, uh, if not, uh, we will begin again in um, 10 minutes when, uh, with the last talk of uh, today, uh, which is Robert Guralnik, Bob Guralnik will be around uh, here. Anyway, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, so it's not, maybe it's stupid about your question about uh, the, the primitive uh, images of the primitives being um, everything. Yeah. Can you use three over two generation to do it? One of them can be like a generator, right? X1. What will say it again? Well, I, I, I don't want to take time from, um, from Bob. Uh, do, do, we, do we have a minute or not? Um, uh, Lance, you are? You I'm are, still uh, here. We three minutes. Get three minutes. I, I, I think it's better that Bob Bob starts, but uh, but um, I had an idea which I'm not sure is. is no, oh, that's good. Yeah, that would be lovely because uh, no, there are, there are, if uh, if you prove it, there is at least one open problem will be solved. Well, that's <laughs> a nice question. I, the end result, aren't they? They're on. on well, the... I will extend Bob's time uh, <laughs> so that the problem can be solved at the end, and this would be very exciting. Uh, <laughs> You've got uh, three minutes to solve it. Okay, yeah. no, no, the idea was, but it's probably stupid because uh, the, it's too easy. Uh, it, you know, if you, you say that uh, uh, one of the primitive is X1 and you just want, you, you want that X1 will not be one, then the image of it uh, is a non-trivial element of the finite simple group. So by three yeah. of the generation, there is another uh, one together they generate. Yeah. Right? But um, it's, uh, I think it's just a starting point, but... Um, yeah, no, I mean, Alex wants the word that it to be onto, so you want to hit everything with primitive elements. Yeah, and, and, and you are taking the subordinated by this... Yeah, element, I want so the I, image. I, I, I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Yes. A nice question. Very nice question. The, the, the image yeah. of the primitives yeah. will be... The image yeah. of the primitive will be everything, right? This is what... As a set, the set of primitives, the image will... Everything, or maybe even if it was a, a very large, it would be kind of good. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But so, and you, but but you wanted to uh, under under epimorphisms, uh, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, under a, every you see, I, I every, don't let like you choose epimorphism. the epimorphism, yes. right? Yes, sure, yes, yes, yes. Oh. Well, we've got uh, 30 seconds. All right. Alex, we can think that it's time definable set. And from the point of logic, it should be everything, it seems to me. But uh, it's a vague idea. Why, so, why this is uh, why time this, definable? Why, the, why the, the, image, the, image, the image of the primitive is definable? It's true that we know that the that the that's that's a highly non-trivial theorem that the primitive elements are closed in the poor finite topology of the free group. But uh, does it has to do with definable? I said, I said I said not definable, type definable. It's not definable necessarily. It's different. It's 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 known. It's not definable, but it's would be type definable, and it, maybe it's enough. Let me see. It's a vague idea. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I think we ought to begin right now. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the last speaker uh, of this session, Robert Garalik of the University of Southern California who will talk about generation theorems for finite groups. Bob? OK, can everybody see? I can see it perfectly. OK, good. OK, well, thank, I want to thank the organizers uh, for, organi for the, their work on the conference and for inviting me to talk here. Um, it's really a, a really a, a great honor for the centennial for Amitsur Amitsur, of course, had a huge influence on many areas of mathematics, and also with some of his students who are on the air, in I think was a student, uh, if I remember correctly, and I think Avi Noam and some others. Uh, I met him a long time ago, a couple of times. I, not, I didn't know him very well. I heard lots of stories 
about him, especially from Lance. And uh, the one th story that I really, that really struck with me, stuck with me was you would prove a nice theorem. You would go to Amatsur and you'd say, I just proved this. And he said, oh, Levitsky did it. So um, anyway, that, that stuck with me. So, and, and I also, uh, Amatsur actually reviewed one of my papers back in 19, early 90s, gave it actually a nice review in math reviews, which for the young people was the predecessor of math signet. So, uh, so anyway, so it's really, Nice to be able to talk here. Um, I don't think there's too many California participants here, although I guess Anair is in California as well as me, but up in San Francisco, but besides Lance. So anyway, so I wanna talk about generation of finite groups. And if I have a little bit of time, maybe algebraic groups, because knowing theorems about algebraic groups tells you about finite groups as well, particularly as simple groups of Lie type which was also already evident in uh, Michael Larson's talk and in Tiep's talk, so. All right, so, um, so let me start. So let's just recall some old theorems about this. If you have a finite, so I'm gonna talk most, mostly about finite groups, but uh, simple groups, but mostly, uh, but, but also some general results as well. Oh, come on. So any finite simple group can be generated by two elements. That's an, an old theorem, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about. And also the P2 of G, that is the probability that two random elements generate G tends to one as the order of the simple group tends to infinity. Okay, so no, neither result implies the other. I mean, the, the second result does certainly imply that it, the first one holds with finitely many exceptions. Uh, the, so the two generation result was proved by Miller for alternating groups, which is quite elementary. Steinberg, after some earlier work by various people on special cases, did the general case for finite simple groups of Lie type. And he did this by actually writing down two elements that generate, to prove they generate. And the sporadic groups were checked by various authors over the years. Um, we know essentially all the maximal subgroups, so it's pretty easy to check this. We, we don't, still don't know all the maximal subgroups for the monster yet, but I would point out there is no proof of any bound on the number of generators required without using the classification of finite simple groups. And even in the proofs that prove two, even for the known simple groups, subgroup structure is, is used. And so you, you, you use the classification in the proofs even for the known cases, for some of the known cases. The probabilistic statement was proved by Dixon for the alternating groups, by Bill Cantor and Alex for classical groups, and by Martin Liebeck and Anair for the exceptional groups. And just the idea is a counting argument. You just look at all, go over all maximal subgroups, count the number of pairs, of elements in a given maximal subgroup, at sum over all the pairs, and to show that that's much less than the order of the group squared as the group gets big. The, for the exceptional groups, uh, Liebeck and Shell have used actually uh, use the fact that they were two, three generated, and then use that to give a bound on how many maximal subgroups. There are other uh, a little bit easier proofs of that using uh, results about how, how many maximal subgroups. So there's a result of uh, Martin and uh, Ben Martin and Anairs that tell, gives you bounds on the number of consciousness classes of maximal subgroups, which can, one can use as well. And you can also use algebraic groups uh, to, to get these kinds of results. And if I, again, if I have time, I'll say a little bit more about this at the end. Basically, openness results in algebraic groups or things that are close to open translate to probabilistic statements for the finite groups of Lie type of bounded rank. Okay, so here's, Anir was just talking about this on the break. Uh, so there's this notion of three halves generation. So if you have a finite simple group and you have a non-trivial element of the group, then it is part of a generating pair. So this is a stronger than just two generation. You can take the first guy to be anything you want Again, there were special cases of this proved. Mala, Saxel, and Weigel proved if G was an involution, you could pick another 
element to do that. And you might think that's actually the hardest case, but the thing is, you know the involutions, whereas if you have an unknown element, it's much harder to, uh, to try to do that. In fact, the proof of one is from a diff different flavor. Uh, sort of if and and you might ask whether well do you still have this probabilistic result well you're not going to always if you pick g randomly and you let h uh, fix it g and let pick h randomly you're certainly not going to have probability go, going to one that's pretty easy to see although you will under for some families of groups but you might ask is is it at least bounded away from zero and the answer is for finite simple groups of lead type it's true, this is an old uh, result with Jason Fullman and myself, but it certainly uh, fails for alternating groups, for example. And in fact, the way you prove one is not by starting with G, it's you start with H. So you sort of fix H, you pick a nice consciousness class so that you can control the maximal subgroups that contain H. And then you, sh you show that there's typically you pick it so there's not very many and so you can show that the union of those maximal subgroups does not contain a conjugate class in the group. And therefore, for any element, some conjugate of that element with, together with that one element that you picked will generate. And if you can bound, you can get enough information about these maximal subgroups, you can even make, get probabilistic statements. So you can pick this H so that the probability for that a random conjugate of G and H generate is actually bounded away from zero. Typically it's at least a half and very often at least two thirds. Um, and there, and it's, in, it's always bounded away from zero. So you can pick a good H. And uh, I'll, I'll, this has some other implications which I'll mention in a minute. But on the other hand, if for example, if Jesus three cycle in AN, then the, then, or just anything that doesn't move very many points, then the probability that G in a random element of AN generate goes to zero is then goes to infinity because uh, for a three cycle, if, you, if it's gonna generate with another element, it better be transitive and that element better have at most, three, at most two cycles. Uh, at most three, I guess, uh, I mean more, sorry. Yeah, at most three cycles, I guess is okay. And anyway, most elements have roughly log N cycles. So this is certainly gonna fail. All right. Okay, so let's make uh, a, a three house generated group is a group with this property. That is, you, you take any non trivial element, there's some el other element that generates. Uh, so, so simple groups are three house generated. That's what we just proved. Note that if, if, if G is three house generated, then every proper quotient has to be cyclic because you can take an element in your normal subgroup, there must be a a, a generator mod that, so it must be cyclic. Uh, in particular, if it's not abelian and three half generated, then it has a unique minimal normal subgroup, which will, the interesting case is when it's a direct product of not abelian simple groups. The case where it's an elementary abelian P group is pretty easy to deal with, extended by a cyclic group. So here's, there's an old notion uh, the spread of a finite group is the minimum k, so that if you give me k non-trivial elements in the group, you can find one x that generates with each one of them individual. So that spread one is exactly three half generated. And you, a, a slightly uh, stronger notion, the uniform spread means you can actually pick a good consciousness class so that you can always take your that element x to live in that fixed consciousness class. So the consciousness class does not depend on the choice of elements. OK. I think you mean maximum uh, in the definition of k, no? Yes, ma maximum. Yes. Yeah. The minimum k is 0. <laughs> yes, maximum. Thank you, Anna. OK. And in fact, what we prove for the statement I prove for simple, the proof of the simple group case is that the uniform spread is always at least one. Okay. This goes back quite a long way. There was a 39 paper Picard. And I don't know if there's one C or two C's in his name, and I'm not sure which Picard it was. There was, uh, but he, it was sort of, he looked at it a little bit. And then starting in the 70s, there were lots of papers 
on this. And in particular, Brenner, Joel Brenner conjectured, there are only finitely many groups with spread exactly one. Uh, and it was conjectured in a paper of uh, Thomas Breuer and Bill Cantor and myself that any the, the obvious uh, necessary condition was sufficient. And this was recently, it was been looked at for in, in quite a number of papers by various authors, uh, especially in the almost simple group case. And uh, this was re earlier this year, was finished off by Tim Burness, Scott Harper, and myself. Uh, both of these conjectures. So G is a finite group if every quotient, every proper quotient is cyclic, not every quotient, obviously. Then the spread is at least two. And moreover, the uniform spread is always is always greater than zero, unless it's the symmetric group of degree six or elementary billion of order P squared. And you can also say the uniform spread is typically at least two as well. Uh, you can have certain uh, groups where the minimal normal suburb is a direct product of A6s, which have uniform spread one. And the SIM6 comes up because it has this extra automorphism, which fuses some obvious constant classes. And so that, that makes uh, life problematic. So. So again, the proof goes similar to the, the proof that we gave for simple groups. You, you look at a generating coset for this quotient of modulo, this unique minimal normal subgroup, and then you want to choose a good element in that coset, namely one that can, lives in only a small number of maximal subgroups. Ideally, you'd like it to live in a unique maximal subgroup. You can't always do that. Uh, I should mention uh, Gareth Tracy and I have a result actually classifying finite groups and, and elements that live in a unique maximal subgroup, which is core free. So that ma maximal subgroup has no, contains no normal subgroups. I, um, okay. And then using results about fixed point ratios, that is the proportion of conjugates of X that live in, the, in these maximal subgroups, you can show that this union of maximal subgroups does not contain any constant class. And so, conjugate of any element will generate. And it gives probabilistic results as well. Uh, so typically it gives results that, as I said, that you know most of the time the probability is at least a half that, that this random conjugate will generate, even in the, for the worst kind of C class. And more often uh, two thirds, not one third, which gives, so the one half bigger than one half gives you spread two, bigger than a third gives you at least spread three. And often you can show this, the spread is very large using this method. And I always like to say in these kinds of problems, you know, Steinberg actually wrote down two elements. Here, we, we don't know as much, as much as Steinberg. So we just say, ah, just pick two random elements or just pick random elements and things tend to work. Uh, so we, it, it's hard to actually write things down in general at work. That's much harder than just counting and, and proving most of the time it actually does work. And moreover, you can actually say when the spread tends to infinity, if you have a sequence of, of groups going off to infinity, and we can, we can precisely say which, when, it, when the spread doesn't go to infinity. And in fact, I think the, maybe the first paper of this or one of the earlier papers was a paper that Anir and I wrote a while ago. So anyway. All right. I should point out that if you look at SP2N of two, these groups just have spread two. So uh, you can't do any better than spread two. You can't say there's only finitely many missing with any with spread uh, bigger than two. Uh, the, 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 in some sense, one of the hardest cases uh, was the case where G was a, the cycle of G is a simple group of Lee type, and the, the quotient is generated by a field automorphism. And here one uses what's called Shitani descent uh, to choose a good element X in a generating coset. So Shitani descent, it normally works, was defined to use with characters and, uh, and kind, uh, but it also works about, it tells you about consciousness classes in the coset of that, of that uh, field automorphism. 
and it allows you to get certain theorems about the maximal subgroups containing those things, which can be related to, for the, at least for the nice maximal subgroups, related to problems in algebraic groups. So uh, uh, we use this uh, very extensively, and Scott Harper has become one of the uh, a leading expert on, on, on using this in, with regard to maximal subgroups in particular. The, the reduction to almost simple groups, I would say, very often they're, when you're trying to prove these theorems, there are fairly easy reductions to almost simple groups. In this case, it was actually not so easy. There was a fair amount of work to reduce to the case of almost simple groups. And uh, this required a, a, a description of the maximal subgroups in the case where your the Sockel is a direct product of non-abelian simple groups. And this was a seminal paper of Oshbacher and Scott, uh, where they where they described the maximal subgroups uh, of ma maximal sub core free subgroups for any finite group. So okay. So um, I want to change gears a little bit uh, and talk about uh, again another recent result, which has a couple of Israeli connections. So, so here, uh, let me call subgroup H of a group intravariant. If, if you take any automorphism of that finite group G, and you look at H and its image under the automorphism, if they're if they're still conjugate by an inner automorphism. So, uh, okay, so uh, 